How do you learn who you really are? It's not found in books. It's found on the battlefield. Yeah, so that's the way I, that's the way we started off. I just have a button. I can just do this. <laughs> I love it. I love <laughs> your buttons. I remember your laugh track and stuff like that. <laughs> I do have to be strategic because like uh, with this setup, it does give a reverb um, mm. where you can hear yourself. And so I turn that off until like it's time to start hitting laugh tracks. But listen, I can very quickly, I got some buttons in here that'll make us flagged that like we have to give royalties to Disney real quick. I'll just tell you, <laughs> I have a whole let it go thing that we do. It's really silly, but oh it my makes gosh, people laugh every I time. That. I was wondering <laughs> like, oh, okay, what Disney thing is he pulling from? But let it go. It makes sense. We do it a lot where I'm like, oh, some things, some curses need to be broken. Mm. Some things need to be fought and slain. And some things you just have to let it go, let it go. <laughs> like, and we'll get into that. It's pretty, it's fun. It makes people laugh. Yeah, that is fun. I like your Batman cut too. Oh yeah. You're authentic. Listen, we can get it. I, I really do want to get in maybe some hero talk because people get it mixed up with like the aspects of warriors. And one thing um, that's interesting, we have a whole segment when it gets into, um, you know, trying to understand ourselves. One of the things that people are like, why do you like Batman so much? Like, why do you like that? There's a, here's a, here's a really funny thing. There was a thing in the nineties when there was this superhero boom, like book boom. And I was a kid during that time. So I was part of this boom. And there was a, an aspect of um, where, Superman became really not very interesting. Like he became not fun to read. Do you know why Batman became so much more popular than Superman? Mm. Just curious. It's nerd stuff. So you're like, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, I'm wondering if it's because like with Batman, they show more sides of him, not just him as the hero, but like him as the human side of himself as well. That is an interesting aspect of it because it's reversed for superman um david carradine gets into that in kill bill how superman is actually reversed mm -hmm. so like bruce wayne becomes batman peter parker becomes spider-man tony stark becomes iron man but superman wakes up superman and becomes uh clark kent he's the other way around and so mm -hmm. his secret identity is to become a human not a human becoming his secret identity yeah which is is super interesting but maybe less relatable so that people don't like it as much well david carradine got into this this is kill bill too so this isn't this isn't even me taking this this is where he said it's interesting to look at if superman wakes up superman and has to put on his clark kent outfit well what is clark how is that guy operate well he fumbles, he's clumsy, he's forgetful, he um, he's slow, he acts kind of dumb about things. Like, oh, I don't really know. Let me figure it out. I don't, I'll don't. i have to look into it. Like, he, he, he is what he perceives people to be. And so Superman acts like how he sees people, which is slow, bumbling, and clumsy. Hmm. That is interesting. So that, that part was a little interesting. Like people didn't catch on that Clark Kent is his personification of how do I see people? Now, the other problem is, is Superman was not very interesting because he was so powerful that if Superman stops bank robbers, well, of course he did. They can't even hurt him. Mm. Like it's yeah. almost like there's there's no adventure. There's no challenge. There's nothing there to overcome. There's no, there's no obstacle. And I think that people forget that the thing that defines us as heroes, that defines you and defines me, is our villains. A lot of times you can't watch a show where everything goes right and still be able to connect because you're like, real life doesn't go right. But when we have to face something that's really scary, really difficult for us to overcome a challenge, whether it's internal or it's external, we have to figure out how to handle or grow through or deal with. Well, that becomes more exciting. This is why there's protagonists in stories. This is why you'll be having a thing or a goal or we're trying to get to a place, but what goes wrong is what makes the story interesting because it's how do we grow to figure it out? Well, with Superman, the only problems they could have that were on his level are global disasters. How many times can it be the end of the world in one before it gets kind of boring? Yeah, like the, for sure. 
he can punch the planet out of orbit. Like, what do you do with that? Like, I, we can't have an everyday relatable problem with this. It's got to be like the planet is going to be invaded by aliens again. And you're like, okay, thanks, Superman. You know, like, you can only do it so many times before you're like, can we get something else? Now let's go into why did Batman become more popular? Batman by himself was a regular dude. Like, he just decided to go a irregular route to handle injustice. Now, the way that he did it was, and this is why I liked Batman the most. I like Batman the most because no matter what his obstacle is, he will figure out a way to beat it. They even had a whole storyline about how um, they got Batman's information to defeat the Justice League. Batman already knew how to beat all of his own crew. Like, you can't have something like Superman or Wonder Woman just go off the cuff, like the Green Lantern, he can just make up whatever he can think of. This is an adversary you have to know how to stop if they ever have a bad day. Batman had kryptonite in his belt buckle at all times. You know why? If Superman has a bad day, everyone has a day. Yeah. We can't have him lose cannon. No, no. There needs to be a way. So, so Batman knew how to beat everything. And in the comics, which is different than the movies, Batman made kryptonite gauntlets and whooped Superman's butt. <laughs> I have to know how to beat this because Superman really can just punch the planet out of orbit. How do you fight that as a dude? How do you fight something that strong? And Batman's like, I'll figure out a way. How do you flash? You can't see him. He's like, well, I made a device to speed him up. So he went faster and jumped dimensions. Now I don't have to fight him. That's so genius. I did not know this aspect about Batman. Now let's go the other way. A lot of his villains are psychology villains. Look at some of the, like, Clayface as Envy. You know, he, he wanted to change how he looked so he would be more beautiful, and it ends up back and makes him a monster. You know, yeah. you look at, uh, you look at, um, you know, the Joker. The Joker is that, that chaos inside of us, that, that, that wild thing inside of us that that just hates order and wants to create the chaos inside of it almost almost the the joke that society is what it is yeah. you know and, and almost like laughing in the face of what is supposed to be normal you know look at base and how the two aspects of it, the duality of our lives the part of us that is what we want people to see and the part of us that is reality of who we are mm -hmm. Look at Mad Hatter and how I wish I could control the madness of my world and how I could control the people around me. Look at the scarecrow is fear itself. Mm. The riddler is the enigma inside of us asking the questions or even the ego and how I believe I am smarter than all those around I'll challenge you with my intellect. Can you keep up? The, the reason Batman became so popular is because he'll figure out a way to defeat all aspects of the parts inside of us that we're fighting, he'll figure it out. He'll find the way to beat it. And that's what made him so interesting is how do you face fear? How do you face envy? How do you face lack of control? How do you face chaos itself? How do you face these things that are part of us and find the way to beat it? You know, Bane was, he would use venom and become rage. He was the equivalent of Batman's Hulk. Right. You know, and we would, how do you face these villains? How do you fight this part inside of yourself? You know, even the, even the irony of Catwoman uh, becoming the love interest, you know, for, for Batman. Well, it's ironic that she was a thief and someone who would steal his heart. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so, it's so well thought out. And as you've said, it's almost like a, representation through these stories of this battleground of the mind that we all go through. Yeah. And that's why I like Batman, not because of the gadgets, but because of the, the, the raw, I'm going to find a way, even if it's impossible, I will find a way. I will not stop. I do not give up. And uh, that's the part that I, that's why I like Batman's my dude.
Now, don't get me wrong. If I could pick any superpower, it wouldn't be Batman's. I'm just saying <laughs> that that gets into a totally different aspect of nerdism. And I don't think that's what the point is today. But I'm just saying that's why I like Batman is because he'll figure it out. He'll find a way. Now, yeah. going on the superhero themes, can I share my Fantastic Four with you? Yes, please. All right. Now, this is where like people are like, oh, we're going to go into Marvel now. We're not going into Marvel. I'm going to go into the Marvel that is you, the Marvel that is us. And I also would like to hear your kind of opinion if you've thought about this at all. For me, I've gone into understanding the four main aspects of myself. I call them my Fantastic Four. That's the heart, body, the mind, and the soul, or the spirit. You know, now there's a bunch of subcategories, but at least these are my main umbrellas and the other ones will fit inside of this for balance. Well, I know that my mastery, as far as there's different type of coaches or different type of psychologists and they get into different aspects of things, my studies and my mastery are going to be in mindset and in action and body. This is the warrior's aspect. I see what the strategy is. How are we going to handle it? You know, and the body side is not rage or anger, even though it is in there. But it also, the passion can come from other aspects like the heart, you know, and passion can also come from soul or spirit. And so we are more complicated than just what do, you know, and so the aspects where I'm as my mastery is in these areas, but I also talk with masters who are masters of the heart, masters of the spirit and soul. And there's different avenues to get there, whether it be faith or vibrations or however people do it, meditation, there's aspects to connect. So my Fantastic Four, I've realized, like, you know, my my mindset size, and this is where the plagiarism probably comes in, my mindset size is my, that's my Tony Stark. I identify very highly the Iron Man character. I very, like, the Tony Stark aspect of, like, um, being obsessed with figuring it out, reading the books, creating your own thing. If it doesn't exist, I will make it. I will I will stay up all night while everyone else is sleeping, living off of just coffee while I create something that's never existed before that will change the way things work. My Tony Stark, I love that aspect. That's my mindset. This is how do I, what am I going to do? What do I need to learn? How do I need to grow in that area? So my Iron Man suit is, is nanotech for sure. Like, so I feel good in this category. Now, my warrior side is more strategic. My warrior side is not afraid of anything. And so this is where this is, I'll nerd a little on you. There was a show back in the 90s called Mighty Max. It was a cartoon about this kid who had like the teleportation to different dimensions, baseball cap. It's a kid show. But his protectors, like he had the wise owl guy who was the wisdom aspect of things, but then he had his protector, his warrior. And his warrior was Norman. And Norman was like the greatest warrior of all time. Like this old, Vi this like Viking warrior guy. And they brought him back to be the greatest protector that they could have. Now, Norman was strong, stoic, powerful, and he had a great presence about him, but it was a, a big hearted protector and would live and die for the, his people. But it didn't matter if it was a five story monster or a pack of goblins. If something came up, he would just like green light. Is it my turn? He's like, you want me to kill it? Like that was his big thing. It's like oh, a giant dragon. He's like, want me to kill it? Is that, is that me? Want me to kill that? Like, <laughs> okay. And they're like, yeah, that's, you got to kill that. He's like, oh, and then he would do, 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 just charge right in. It didn't matter what it was. Want me to kill it? And I'm like, that's, I feel that part. Strong, confident, protect, take care of your people. But it doesn't matter what comes up. Do you want me to kill it? Like, let me know what we're doing. All right. That one comes in. Now, this is where people may relate or not relate. I don't, it doesn't matter. This is your fantastic for figure out your side. My spirit side, I do go more Christianity, but not religion, church. Read Christ. Like, actually start at Matthew and get through John. Like, just read the dude because he's fantastic. Like, Jesus himself was a badass. And I think that he... He clears up a lot of stuff that people really mess up with religion. And so I've had some pretty, pretty hardcore go against some people who like use the Bible as a weapon conversations. So I'm like, if you call yourself a Christian, you should maybe listen to the guy himself because he says, don't do what you're doing. You know, Matthew seven, right at the end of it, you read it like, go ahead. You know, this is one of those things, but I, I identify a lot more on that aspect as a surrender. I give myself to God and I follow Jesus as though I, I have screwed up so much. I have failed in so many ways. I have hurt people, sometimes deliberately, sometimes not. 
I have made all these mistakes that are meant to teach me something. So show me the way I will follow. And you say, love God with all your mind, body, soul, and heart. Love him with all your fantastic four. Love him with that part. But then love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Treat people at the very beginning, at the very base level, at least the way you want to be treated. At least start there. And I'm like, listen, I'm an apostle. I'm like the 700th apostle or something. I'm like, wherever you're going, I'm going. Like, uh, I'm following. You know, if you if you have the way, I'll follow. And so I, that aspect of me is in a a following mindset. I'm not the leader there, but I'm here to serve. How do I serve? Now, this is where I found it interesting in the heart side. My heart side is highly repressed, and a lot of my men, all the warriors I work with, a lot of times this is the side that's been suppressed the most. This gets into coping mechanisms. This gets into the pain aspect. But in my other parts, I was more fight or more figure it out. My heart side is flight. When it comes to affairs of the heart, I would run away. If it's going to hurt, I can't have that fight, and I would run. And so a lot of guys are like, I'm fight, for sure, I'm fight. Until it's going to hurt your feelings and your flight. Smoke silhouette. Pew. And you're like, oh, man, that part of you may not be may not be very well trained because it's been suppressed. When people talk about inner child work and they talk about that aspect, it is not in your mind side and it's not on the body side. And it may also not be in your faith or spirit side. It's in your heart side. And even in my own journey, in my own growth, I'm a master on this side. I'm almost a novice on this other side. This is why there are different types of coaches that I would put out there. Like, which is your strength? Are you heart? Are you spirit? Are you mind? Are you body? Where is your Where is your mastery? Because they all work together and you need each. But it's not one is the answer because we need balance also, which does get into a far more complicated conversation of what the hell is balance. So yeah. I realized the inner child work and stuff for myself couldn't find that kid. It honestly brings me to tears. Often I've been doing a lot of inner child work. That little this eight-year-old kid locked in a room who was just nobody wanted to play. And since I've been doing that own work, I like we have some pretty hardcore things that I've been teaching on this. I've been taking my very healthy versions of myself in to go hang out with this little dude who's just been locked away for so long. And like just between us, even I, I tell my girl this. Like my eight-year-old kid loves the warrior. He loves Norman. He's like, I hang with him all the time, man. But he loves to just be chosen. I want to hang out with you. And this is where people say, love yourself. Start with like yourself. Start with at least hang out with. At least enjoy being around you. Before you have to fall in love, at least like, or at least, you know, before you love, like at least get to crush. At least yeah. in being around yourself until you learn to grow to love yourself and that part has been interesting because i've also in my heart area found a hopeless romantic who was hurt a lot and it would probably be the saddest part inside of my heart is the guy who was supposed to be love the romantic that romantic part and the amount of damage that we take in that category is probably the highest amount of damage that we can see and it's not just from relationships it comes from parents betrayal from a best friend you know um Love, love has got the highest aspect of pain that we've ever had. And this is a representation of that side needs to have its own, its own fighting style. But it is different. I just don't go in alone, though, because my warrior will jump in the way as soon as somebody wants to do harm again. Mm. You, want to hit, you want to fight an eight-year-old, you got to come through me to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that part where we have to find our balance within all of them because they all work together. So this is just a part of my story. When I when I share this with you, what would you say? Like I can identify my fantastic four. I, this is how I do my style with that. Yeah, I mean, I love this idea that you have of the fantastic four and really just looking at yourself in this more multifaceted way, because I think most of the time in our society, we mainly focus on the two of mind and body, because they're more easy to measure. They're what get us to take action a lot of the time. But really, that emotional piece, that heart piece is so powerful. And I'd say this is probably the most overlooked piece of the puzzle. 
Um, so how I like to look at this is instead of heart, I usually use the term emotional. So I would say like mental, physical, emotional, and then spiritual health. But of course, your heart also incorporates more your emotions, like your intuition and things like that as well. Um, but for me, that piece of the puzzle has just been vital in my own journey because for a long time, I felt like I was battling with my mind and my body, but I wasn't understanding that critical piece that almost serves as the bridge between the two. Like, I like to think about it this way. When our soul or whatever you believe in your spirit or energy comes into the physical body, and it combines with that more nature, the emotional body is almost the result of that combination of the spiritual and the physical. And it goes so far beyond the mental where I find a lot of the time we sort of blur the two. For example, a big part of my story was dealing with anxiety. I had chronic anxiety for the first decades of my life. And for a long time, it was really only seen as a mental thing. And so I spent a lot of time battling my mind, hating my mind, saying, why was I given this brain if it's going to make me feel these ways? But then when I started to realize that it wasn't actually just my mind, that my emotions were a huge part of this, it became really liberating because no longer did I feel like it was me, right? I think a lot of us, we get caught up in this thing of something's wrong with me. Like if you're feeling too strong of, maybe you have outbursts of anger or, or like me, too much anxiety and fear that becomes debilitating. It's easy to feel like, oh, something's wrong with me. Like I have this chronic mental illness, which is what I was being told. And that almost leaves you in what feels like a losing battle. Like in my mind at that time, I thought if I need to keep battling through all of this throughout the day, just to get to those tiny little glimmers of joy and of peace, then it's not worth it. And I don't want to live in this, in this body and in this brain. But when I started to realize actually the quote that really stuck out to me, uh, Eckhart Tolle in his book, A New Earth. He says, if I can't live with myself, then there must be a difference between me and myself. And this was the first pivotal moment for me that was like, okay, if I can't live with myself, I can't live with all this mind chatter that's going on. Who is the observer of that? And how is that separate from these experiences that I'm going through? And then that allowed me to start to see like, okay, these physical feelings, like this sweating that I'm getting or the shaking or these emotional feelings of just overwhelm and, and the overthinking that came in the mental aspect, right? There was still me behind all of that. And so by starting to figure this out, I started to realize like, maybe I don't actually need to even be in the battle. I can kind of stop fighting myself and take a step back and be that observer. And when you're able to do that, it's, it's kind of funny because all the things that you thought were like the end of the world and the biggest deal, you can almost kind of chuckle at them because they're much smaller I don't want to say silly. I mean, I've been there. I can feel how hugely it impacts your life. But when you can really see them from this new perspective, they become more small and, and more manageable. Yeah. I love it. I, I really feel like, you know what? I'm just going to give you a heads up. I um, scheduled us for like three hours because I already see how this conversation is going to go. So like, gotcha. this is awesome. Like we found, we found similar things and I love that your eating style and, and the way that you've gone into your battles is from a different point of view. And, it, and it's inspiring for people to know that it's not just one way. And when I train my warriors, fight with your style. Do not be me. If I fight with battle axe and you fight with, you know, fireballs and lightning, fight your style. If you're a mage, be a mage. If you're a warrior, be a warrior. That's front line. Like be your style. Some are archers and some are planners. Some are generals and strategists. Some are Jedis. Like figure out your style and your style. And I love that you have figured out your style. And I love the way that you've done this. Um, Commonalities that we have found. I love that you said I used to hate my mind. I used to hate my own mind yeah. because the, the, the thing that I say, and this is something I'm going to bring up more and more. There are the parts of us. Your warrior is the part that comes into challenge. And I believe that all things, including me and including you, should be challenged for authenticity. Challenge this. Does it work? Does it not work? Don't just go off of marketing. Don't go off of a, a, a piece of paper or a plaque on the wall. Don't go off of somebody has a degree because I have run circles on PhDs. It doesn't matter. Have you done it or have you not done it? 
Have you built it or have you not built it? Have you been there or not been there? Have you done the work or did you just read the book? And people very quickly start realizing the difference of someone who read about fighting and someone who has tried and been in fights. And you're like, I went into the fight because I hated my mind. I hated me. I hated me because I had a belief system that deserved to be challenged. I have a chronic mental illness. And I challenge, I challenge directly, no, you do not. You are brilliant. You are not broken. You do not have a chronic mental illness. You have an untrained superpower. You have the ability to look into the future and you can feel all of the feelings of a potential outcome that's not happening. That's amazing. You are not broken. Your creativity and imagination is so powerful that you can time travel and have arguments and feelings over something that's not happening. Side note, a funny thing here. Have you ever had like like a argument in your head, like maybe with your husband or with a, with a potential conflict or a client or a friend where you're like, oh, if they say this thing, oh, I'm so mad. Have you ever had like any like conversations in your head that got you heated? Yeah, see, I think this kind of highlights our different warrior types a little bit because I definitely will play out those circumstances ahead. Or for me, mm -hmm. it'll be more so like, oh, if a conflict's coming, like maybe a perceived conflict that I think could happen, then I'm more of the avoidant. So I'm more thinking about instead of what can I say? I'm going to say this. If they say that, I'm more like, okay, how can I avoid them to say that? Let's like circle around this all together. <laughs> yeah, no, which is, which there's tactics and ways to do it. And I'll get into that part for the, like the avoiding thing. That's a different uh, coping mechanism for what things are out of control. So I, I, I have happy to get into this part. The, the thing that makes it interesting is to challenge the mental illness aspect to understand that you have a superpower. That part has been so powerful for people to understand that the, um, the belief system that you are broken, the belief system that there's something wrong with you, the belief system that being able to do this is something wrong. Like that has to be challenged. And I, that's why we've been winning and, and beating these battles so much. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> But you know how you've been having those arguments in your head where you're even planning on your exit strategy? Yeah. Like, here's what's really funny. Listen who you're arguing with or the potential conflict is with. Who makes up their answers? Me. So that means you're making up the answers for somebody else and having an emotional response or retreating in some way, shape, or form from who again? Myself. This means I've got an either upset or angry, or frustrated, or took off from me. I'm fighting with me for real. This is the battlefield of the mind. Yeah, You're in conflict, making up answers using somebody else's face as the scapegoat for my own words that make me angry at what I made them say. Mm -hmm. If we say well, it out loud, it seems kind of silly. It's so silly to think about it. And like this happens before, as you mentioned, when we're thinking about it, but I'd argue it's actually happening in the moment too. Like if you're in the, if you're in the argument, the only reason that it's actually affecting you emotionally is because of what you said to yourself. Because I, I find it's a funny analogy when people say, right? Like if I were to yell at you and tell you were stupid and ugly in Chinese, like what would you do? You'd probably just be like, yeah, I, don't I don't know. I don't know what but, they just said. <laughs> But if you say it in, in something that's understandable, obviously, then you repeat these things in your head and you're really the one who's making you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, it's interesting to watch how we can get mad at us and then take it home to the person who actually didn't say any of the things that we made up for them. And tell me you haven't walked in with you and your husband with potential conflict and been like, oh, you better not. And he's like, hey, babe, how was your day? And you're like, don't how's your day me after the conversation in the car we just had. <laughs> like, I wasn't there. <laughs> so I, what did we talk about? Yeah. <laughs> well, we got a big fight. It was bad, too. Did we? I'm about, I'm about ready to pack up my bags. I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> yeah. But I think even just understanding that this is how it works, like we're telling ourselves these stories and that's what's creating our experience is so empowering because even now... 
Um, I've done a lot of reading of Marissa Peer, if you've heard of her, and she has one book called Tell Yourself a Better Lie. And that is just one of my favorite quotes alone. That'll come into my head when I'm telling myself about something that happened and the story I'm telling. I'm like, tell yourself a lie, Nicole. Is that really what's happening? Is that really how it's going down? Or is that more your emotional body talking and just trying to pull in more of the things to to see itself and feel that feeling? Yeah, I like that's a good way to challenge is tell a better lie. I also yeah. appreciate the part where you said be the observer. Mm. I call that being present in the present. Like have a presence in the present. Like, hold on a second. This fear hate this, by the way. So anybody listening to this, uh, anxiety is a byproduct of fear amplified, fear multiplied. But if you understand how fear works, that all of what we're talking about is potential futures. It's just things that could happen, but most likely don't. Well, fear isn't real. It's just something that might happen and a lot of times isn't happening. But if you have presence in the presence, I think it was the Lao Tzu quote that anxiety is in the future, depression is in the past, but you know, peace is in the present. Mm -hmm. You know, the have presence in the present. And so if you want to get a head start on even just that one situation, you start off with this because anxiety, the answer is I don't know what happens yet. But just fear itself is is it happening now? And so stop and go like, oh, that could be so bad. And go, hold on a second. Look around. Look, look. Is that happening right now or just something that could and has a very low percentage chance of happening? And if you stop for a second and give yourself presence in the presence, be the observer, you'll go, well, no, it's not happening right now. And it's like, so which lie are you telling again? Which thing did you make up? What emotions are you having over a possible future that you have untrained? I like that you said, it may, maybe I'm saying it wrong. I'll share my, my quote that's helped me pull out of this too. I can't live with myself, then I am separate from myself. How did that quote go? Yeah, it's if I can't live with myself, then there must be a difference between me and myself. There must be a difference between me and myself. This means like this is a... Uh, this is a, there's a couple parts to this and there's a resistance there between who I am. This is usually a, a reveal of denial also, which is one of the main curses that syncs up very well with fear. This means I do not want to deal. This is your system too, is the denial system. That's a flight system. This means um, retreat, hide, suppress, like retreat is denial. I don't want to deal with it. So and so the correspondence between our grieving cycle and our coping mechanisms a lot of times goes hand in hand. And so I don't want to deal with the reality of what this is. I don't like my reality. And so I'm going to get out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to hide that or I'm just going to push that down and we're going to pretend like that's not a problem. It's denial. This is a big part of that. And so am I separate from myself means I have a duality in who I am because I'm trying to deny my reality. I mean, a war with what is. When you're in that war with what is, you're going to be fighting to try to keep the persona alive. And the enemy of this persona is authenticity. Well, is that really you? Well, I'm scared to be what that is. Fear coming in. I'm scared to be what that is because maybe they won't like me. Maybe this will happen. Maybe they'll do this. This could also be a problem. But then they'll expose me as a fraud, whatever. Or maybe they'll love you. Or maybe they'll be grateful, or maybe they'll connect with you more, or maybe those aren't the people who you have to be fake for that would be very good for your life. Yeah. You know, we have to really look at our reality and get into the problem solving stuff that we had before. My favorite quote was an Epictetus quote. It says that circumstances, it's, um, I mean, this is like over 2000 years ago. So like they were very, what makes a man, let's make it a little more PC, circumstances do not define a person, they reveal them to themselves. So it reveals the person to themselves. And what I mean by that is, if you look at how you handled it, that's who you are. Were you jealous? Were you vengeful? Were you sneaky? Were you a liar? Were you, um, you know, mean or aggressive? How did you handle this? What did you do? What you have done and how you choose to do things reveals to you who you really are. Mm -hmm. It's not revealed to them. It reveals to you. And if you start getting into a combination of denial and excuses to create that beautiful word justification, we're not playing with the full truth here. We're playing with part truth. There's truth in there. 
but it's not fully true. So I can justify and give myself alleviation of guilt and responsibility because I do not have to be accountable. I do not have to be authentic. I did it because they did that. It's their fault. Well, I wouldn't have to if they didn't. Who are you? Look at who you are because you do things you would hate done to you with impunity, but you would be very vengeful and rageful if ever done to you. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. Is there a duality there? Is there a, I must be separate from myself? There is. That man's villain would be Mm Two-Face. Yeah. No, I love the idea of Two-Face there. And I just like that you mentioned that, you know, everything really is a reflection of ourselves from, from circumstances to people. This is something I learned as well. Like if you're judging or you're saying comments about somebody else, it's really just only about you. And one of the things I noticed for me was something that would always come into my head, my go-to, I guess, like swear or, or um, criticism would be, that's so stupid. You're so stupid. And what it really showed is reflecting back on me a fear of being stupid and of not having the knowledge. And so I think that kind of is just another lens to look at it through. Who are you comparing yourself to to be so stupid? This is this is very true. That's a great question. Who was it? Who was your person? Who did I compare myself to be not smart enough? I think I I don't even think I compared myself with an actual person, but just this idea of who I thought thought that I should be, I guess. Who was that? You created a new character that is what? Brilliant? Mm -hmm. Knows everything? Like, who did you, there's a comparison here. Who did you create to say, I'm not like, I'm not enough? Mm -hmm. Who is it? Mm -hmm. I can't think of a who, you know, that's a really good question. I got to reflect on this a bit more. She's in there. Whoever is in there. there. There's a thing in there that I compare myself to. There's a thing I'm fighting. And this is where the warrior's way comes in. Is like, let's go in and find it. And then let's see, let's challenge it. Let's fight it. Let's see, is it, is it, it could be a curse. This could be a curse that somebody, when you were in second grade, said you're not very smart. This could be a curse that was put on you that we nurtured for our whole life. But it could also be someone in there where there's a real voice of like a, a parent or like a loved one or a best friend or somebody who's like, you're dumb, you're a stupid person. Like nobody will ever listen to you, you're stupid. And that got put in there and maybe that's a battle that needs to be fought. But we Mm -hmm. have to challenge this belief system. Am I really stupid? Well, compared to who? I mean, compared to someone who can't read, you're brilliant. Because you can just gather information at any time. You can gather any book. I'm, you know, here's another book. One of the guys rep- recommended uh, the Alchemist. So I'm just going through this. This is a spirit side book, and this is not my strongest area. So I'm like, okay, let's go into my weak areas. I'm going to go toward my weak spots. Let's learn. And it's a tough start for me. It's not my style of reading. I like the more informative stuff, but it gets more into the story and the, the connection aspect. Okay, part of my growth, part of my evolution. Am I going toward the piece that makes it so I got to figure out the thing in there that's I'm fighting? What am I fighting? Go toward it. But there's somebody you even may have made up or maybe somebody else's voice that you're fighting that says you're not very smart. Yeah. Mine was my dad's. I was, that's my old man. And I had to work through that one pretty quickly. I'm like, wait a second. That's not true. Like, you know, I've also had uh, tough moments. I had a, I had a very uh, tough childhood. So kids who are in abusive homes and kids who have very, uh, you know, troubled childhoods. I wasn't a straight A student. I was like a C's and B's on a good day student because I was, you know, I didn't know at the time, but I was in a very turbulent lifestyle. And so that kid would be acting out or trying to get attention or, you know, you know, being more aggressive or being a little rougher because like I was hurt and I didn't know what that was, but I couldn't focus. Also, I didn't find out until I was in like seventh grade that I couldn't see further than my hand. And so all chalkboards were blurry. Oh, yeah. And I mean, as you say that, I've I've definitely done a lot of work going back in doing inner child work and seeing like, when did I actually get these beliefs picked up that I had to be smart, that I had to be perfect is really what a lot of it came down to is I can't make mm-hmm. a mistake, right? Um, and I think for a long time, whether or not it was true, I felt that I only received love if I proved that it was worth it, right? If I proved myself in some way. 
to be smart, to be, you know, and I think this is the case for a lot of us as it comes back down to, we all just want to be enough and we all crave that love. However far, far away you are from that need for love. I think a lot of the time this comes back down to that, this core issue that we have is, is wanting to be loved, but for who we truly are. But we won't be who we truly are because that won't get love. Yeah. That's a belief system in there. If I'm who I really am, I won't get love. So I have to be what I think they want, which is, is it enough or is it perfect? Mm-hmm. What's the difference between enough and perfect? How far well, is I that? I mean, enough? perfect is a subjective thing, right? Well, um, I don't know I if just... it is. I don't know if, if perfect is as subjective because mm-hmm. it is either absolutely flawless and there is no more improvement that can be made. I don't know if that's subjective. Sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be, but sometimes it's, that's perfect. Well, I guess in that right then, then there is no perfect, right? Because everything can have improvement and stuff. Okay. Well then even having that belief system of I need to be perfect is impossible because there is no perfect. And so now I am aiming at nothing. And if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Yeah. Okay. So then what is enough? What am I comparing to? to be enough. Yeah. I think um, when I think about that idea of being enough, it can come back to being like, it. I think it depends on the situation. But in this case, thinking about the smartness, like enough, um, doing enough, like achieving enough, feeling like I was going to be loved for my achievements rather than who I actually was. It's type three Enneagram, maybe even some type one stuff in there. (laughs) I have to achieve to get love. I have to be the best. I have to win, be noticed and be appreciated and be loved. In which case, what does it mean to be worthy of love? What does it mean? If I have to be the best, I have to achieve, I have to win, I have to have success, I have to have this result. If results equal love, well, what result is needed to deserve and be worthy of love? There, There is no result or thing that is worthy of love. I would say that everything is deserving of love. It's, it's more, this is the story that I told myself, right? Yeah. In and unknowingly, case, right? We don't even oftentimes know these stories. I was more saying like, I need to be smart and other people are so stupid, but digging deeper unveiled that story. Yeah. This is, these are the tough questions. This is warrior talk, by the way. This is when I go into it, like, let's ask the question that people are afraid to ask. Let's answer the questions that people are afraid to answer. You know, I think, uh, let's see, I have, where's my quotes? There's a Bernard Heisch quote that I use often for my warriors. This is, uh, advances are made by answering questions, yet discoveries are made by questioning answers. And so ask the question that you don't want to answer and then challenge the answer that you just gave. Mm-hmm. Like, this is how you find who you really are. And you said there there is measurement for what enough is to get love because all things deserve love and yet you didn't Mm -hmm. what an interesting contradiction of beliefs now when we go into deep work stuff the stuff where we got to tear that stuff one of these has to go because these are conflicting beliefs and one of them is inauthentic and one of them is true but nobody will decide for you because whether you choose i am not worthy of love or all things are worthy of love Life will go on around you either way. Nobody will change or do anything about it. This is in you only. This is the battlefield of the mind. Which of these do I allow to come in? Because one is staying out and one stays in, but they cannot cohabitate the same space. They are conflicting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So there's only conflict in my head, but I will evict one of these. Do I evict that I am worthy of love? Or do I evict that there is no worthiness within me? I am not smart enough, cool enough, successful enough, achieved enough. I am not enough. One of these stays and one of these needs to go. Which would you choose? Well, I would choose to get rid of the second one that you mentioned around not being enough. Yet, why do they still have luggage in the castle? Why are they still, why do they still have things in here? Yeah. And I mean, I think this actually was really highlights clearly a flaw in how a lot of people end up looking at mental health stuff in general is they start to think about, well, why do you feel that way? Right. And, and what is the belief behind 
questions that I remember being questioned so, so often in my journey, because at one point I had pretty bad OCD. So there was, you know, I couldn't walk along a sidewalk without just having even spaced steps in between. And they'd say, well, why? Like, why do you believe that? What do you think is going to happen? Right. And for me, it was really tricky. It's like this perplexed a lot of the psychologists and stuff out there because I was like, I don't know. There's nothing that I feel is going to happen. I don't actually have a belief. It's just an overwhelming feeling in my body. And so going past that mental into more of the emotional work was really the key for me. Simplicity is genius with this one too. Why did you have to do something that had an OCD behavior? Well, the simple answer is I can control. It gave me something that I felt I could control. I can do a behavior. I can do a repetition. I can do, I'm in control of something. Well, why do you need to feel in control? Well, because the life around me or the world that I'm in, whether it be the lifestyle, the parents, the dynamics, the life I'm in, I don't have control. I need control of something. I mean, we're relatable. One is, have you ever um, gone through a transformation or let something go and changed your hair color? Yeah. I got your nails did. Made a change. You know, one of my ones as a guy, you know, I'm a gorilla. Like one of the ones I would do is like when I would shed like a, a layer or a skin or level up, I would I would shave my arms or my chest or cut my hair or do something to shave my beard down. Like I would control something. And it, it was just it was a, it was a, a manifestation of me, A, having control of anything, but B, also shedding a layer that I no longer needed, like a skin being broken off like a snake or some shitting that that layer so I can grow. Yeah. Now. This is a weird subconscious thing that I need control. The, the OCD thing was I need control. I don't have it. But instead of going toward, and this is what I, I've been calling this the resistance lighthouse. This is where like I can see where land is, but I don't want to go there and I go the other way. There's a, there's a retreat system there. No, instead of going, I am resisting this sense of I don't have control. Go toward it because that you need to do your work, not get away. And what's happening is not revealing that you're not good enough. It's showing where you need to work for you. So are you going to go toward and do the work, or are you going to justify and make excuses, living in denial by retreating from it? You can choose, and everybody in your life, their life will go on because they're all in their own battles too. Whether you choose to be nothing or be amazing, their life goes on. We all have our own challenges, our own fights, our own things. Yeah. You know, and so this is where I would say, do you go towards that or do you go away from it? Because that's showing where your work is. I don't have control. Why don't you have control? Because of my circumstances. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel scared. So now we're back in fear again. Well, how do you face fear? Well, fear is not real. Fear is me manifesting something that I could go wrong. It's like, okay, let's look into worried about could go wrong and then have presence in the present. And now we've gone through step, 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 step to get to the belief system. Do you really believe when you look in the present that that is something you need to be concerned with? And you look and say, in my presence of the presence as the observer, I do not see any danger here. And you're like, do we still need to be in an OCD mindset when you are in control. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't need to have a representation of having control when I'm in control. Mm -hmm. And that's the steps. This is why the psychologist may be perplexed. Like, what is going on here? And you're like, you're. did you just try to jump from, I don't have control to belief system because you missed four steps to get there. And this means it's an impossible bridge, which now creates a disorder, a mental illness. You have symptoms. No, you're brilliant. You just don't have training. People don't want to put the work in. I want to give you medication instead. I don't want to put the work in to train you. That takes that takes months to years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And I mean, it doesn't necessarily make as much money either for the medical system, which is no, another story not. there. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, what I noticed is that even as I started to, as you've kind of broken down logically, like why did I actually have those OCD behaviors? I found that similar thing as control was the big thing behind it. And I had other behaviors that I also saw control through, like controlling my eating, for example, that was the only thing I could control. And I felt out of control in other ways. But the problem that I still encountered, which I'm curious to hear your thoughts around is that even when I logically 
thought through it and was like, okay, I'm doing this out of control and it's not actually giving me control and things like that. Or even logically seeing the purpose of, okay, why was I experiencing anxiety? Didn't necessarily stop the emotions from still coming up. So for me, a large part of it was actually going in and having to reprogram my subconscious and release trapped emotions from my emotional body so that I could take that logical action. Because for a long time, I tried to like consciously drill it into my head from, you know, going to Tony Robbins events, doing affirmations and things like that. But it never stopped the feeling from coming up until I actually went down into the body and did the work there. Yes, that is... Correct. It, this is you. You've just explained why the answers are not the solutions. This is why I have that video that seems more profound, and that's why when you explain what you just did, that's where like now do you see? I had the answers. I went to the event. I read the books. I knew all the stuff. I knew what it's supposed to be. I know the freaking answer, and like I know it's supposed to look like this. I know it's supposed to be the Rubik's cube is the same on all sides. I know the answer. And I went to the event, I got the greens, but the rest of it is still not correct. The rest is not solved, but I got greens. But it seems like if I do any work on anything else, as soon as I go, let's get the reds, I got to mess up my greens to do it. I don't understand why my mind doesn't do it. Yeah. The answers aren't the solution. Being able to dig deep and go in and see where is the actual thing you need to work on. Go toward the problem. Get in. Go farther. Go beyond what everyone is saying. This is the answer. And go to who am I? And you will find that the answers line up as you do the journey. And here we are now back in anxiety over people going, you're doing it wrong. You're not enough. You're you're not that's not how it's done that's not the answer you didn't do it right and here i am struggling to be enough be worthy and be able to find my authenticity on a journey to find the answers that seem correct but people are judging my journey and don't judge my journey because that's how you get to the answers and that's why you have to have that warrior mentality that's the part of you that keeps going even when you want to quit is the part of you that will will see there's an obstacle that needs to be beaten I have to remove this. There's a layer, but I don't know what's under it. So I have to have courage to pull the layer back regardless of what's going to come out. There is a balance between heart and warrior. There is a balance here. And I don't want people to misunderstand a warrior mindset as a toxic masculinity mindset. No warriors are going to be like your stoic. It's going to be your part that's like, I can handle whatever battle comes in without losing my cool. Bring it. Yeah. I don't care if it's a five-story monster or a tiny goblin who wants to bite my ankles. Do you want me to kill it? Yeah. Like, and I mean, it gives you that courage to go deeper. Mm-hmm. Remember, I'm going to add two more things to before. Now, once you get into that moment and you see what monster it is, what curse you have, what thing has been nurtured for 10, 20, 30 years, once you find it, there's a lot less anxiety once you know what it is and to go into your training. This is where I train the anxiety part. Do you remember I had four last time? I have six now. Hmm. Four last time. You remember, do you have problem solving? Yeah, you got those skills. I got problem solving. You got creativity skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got those. Do you have a support system? Yep. Yep. Do you have resourcefulness? Yes. We, we had those ones. I now let's those. add let's add in two more parts. Mm -hmm. Do you have a faith or belief you are not alone? There there is more to you. This is the spirit side. Do you, is there more to you than just you? You are not alone. Yes. Be it God, be it universe, be it vibrations, be it purpose. I don't care what it is. You are not alone. There's more to you than just this. You have faith. Mm -hmm. And the last part, are you more qualified now to handle problems than some of the really difficult stuff you face in the future with less experience, less wisdom, less training, and less of the abilities you had before? Are you more qualified now to handle what comes up than when you were much younger? Yeah, a thousand percent. Bring it on. Let's find some shit. Yeah.
heal it back. Let's let's unlock a monster. Let's bring one out. Let's see what I have to fight today. Yeah. And I love the perspective that you take on this because I think in so much of our dialogue around mental health, it comes down to like a lot more victim mentality than that warrior mentality of like, well, I have this and be gentle with yourself because, you know, mental illness is real and things like that. And like, I'm all for, you know, people looking deeper and trying to understand more of their mental health, but we can't be babying it and treating it like it's this thing. Like, we need to be more courageous, like you've said. And I wish that this was something that I had been taught at a much younger age, because instead of being told like, well, Nicole, you have all this resourcefulness, you have this intelligence, you have this creative ability to go into the future and feel things, which by the way, is like the premise of manifestation and creating your reality. So if anything, you have this superpower to create and design whatever reality that you want, just right inside of your head. Instead, I was being told like, well, you have a chronic illness and, you know, chronic anxiety is very common amongst intelligent people. And I started to be like, you mean I was given this smart brain so that I could be miserable my whole life? This is not the thing. <laughs> so right. I just love the reframe that you give on, on seeing this as a superpower, because I think it's so empowering on instead of trying to be like, how can I get through life? And like I had mentioned, experience those glimmers, despite you know, anxiety is always going to be there. It's something that I was always told and you'll learn how to manage it manage it. Yes, of course, anxiety is an emotion that is part of the human experience, but that's not really what I heard, right? I heard you will be ill forever and you will mm -hmm. have through and you'll learn how to, you know, get through those hard times to experience the good times. But it would have been so much more empowering for me to have heard like, this is actually a skill of yours that you can develop more and you have such a powerful brain. You just don't, you haven't read the user manual yet. Instead and you of like, haven't oh, been you around have anybody who's done it. <laughs> Here are the pills and, and go on your way. Wrong. It doesn't work. It just creates more problems. This is a, I call it your damsel mentality. Hmm. Are you a dam? Are you in damsel mode where you're waiting for someone to come and rescue you on a white horse? Are you waiting for a hero? This is uh, a lot of times whenever you're working with people, you'll see that you ever seen a, a little kid who's like, there's like those uh, the, in the in a lake or something, they'll have the, that like line for the floaties, like the boundary line where it's like, don't go past here because it gets really, really deep. Yeah. And you'll see like a little kid will be hanging on to a parent and then they let them go and they grab that in full panic and they're like holding on to it in like fetal position for dear life like no no i'm gonna die i, I, I can't touch this. this is horrible i'm in i'm this is i'm gonna die somebody help me somebody help me and they're like stand up <laughs> and they put their feet down and they realize it's like you know waist high or chest high and they can touch the whole time this is a lot of times what like people are doing in the mental health field is they'll say i'm going to treat the symptoms of um, your feet are touching the, the ground, which means you must have a disorder instead of going, well, just try and touch. And you're like, well, I can touch here. And so it turns out I didn't need a hero and I didn't need to be in damsel mode. I could touch the whole time. Mm -hmm. Or let's teach you how to swim so you no longer have to hold on to this in terror because you're trained how to swim, because you're built to swim. So let's swim. And I'll swim with you. We're like, yeah, well, that takes time. And I don't have this, the doctor or someone who would prescribe medication to be there to help train them how to swim. It's like, well, then they'll always feel like they need the floaty. They'll always feel like they, they can never touch. They'll feel out of control. They'll wait for a hero or a prince to come and save you. But you could always touch. And, or you could learn to swim. And this makes you a better partner because now we can swim together and reach new new locations, do beautiful things and check out things without being absolutely petrified because I am trained and not untrained. Mm -hmm. People teach treat the symptoms and they don't treat the root. You do not have to stay in damsel mode. Mm -hmm. There is a fighter inside of you, a fire, a passion inside of you that wants to do action. And that's the part that we work on. Because look, you've seen like you, I really liked your analogy. I go to Tony Robbins, the books and I'm listening to that, fuck, don't get me started on hustle mentality. Don't get me started, like, don't get me started. All of the answer, 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 answer. Mm -hmm. But there is no training on the solutions. And the people who have the answers and the solutions are like, 
Well, it says here, if you're going through hell, uh, you should be coming up on a bridge in the book. It says there should be a thing there. Well, I go into hell to go get people, and I listen to the advice that's given, and I go, there hasn't been a bridge there for years. When was the last time you went into hell? You'll see you. there's a whole bunch of people standing at that spot wondering what they're doing wrong. There's a bunch of people wondering why they're not good enough, why they're not smart enough, why they can't be successful, why they can't be worthy of love, because you're telling them to cross a bridge that isn't there. Go get them and you'll find that you're giving advice leads people to a dead end and they feel like they're the problem because you have a PhD and you read a book. And I'm like, listen, go get them. Have some courage to go and find them because I go into hell and I'll come and meet you right where you are and I'll show you the way out. And it's not that fucking empty bridge. (laughs) There's a way you have to go. And it's not that way. So yeah. I see it. And this is where I, like the, the warrior in you has to go. Not, I will carry you out, Nicole. Like, get your shoes on. I'll show you the way. And then once you know the way, come back and get somebody. Yeah. So that's that's my warrior. That's where it's like, this isn't toxic, you know, battle. This isn't go in and cut people out of your life. And these crazy behaviors that, you know, you have to be angry or mean. It is the opposite. Yeah. You do it out of service. You do it out of love. And you do it because you will face the fears inside of you, the duality inside of me, that I am fighting who I really am. Well, one of you has to go. Is it going to be real you? And you're going to try and grow the persona to match what you think other people are thinking? Those arguments that you make up for them in your head that is not true? Mm-hmm. Tell a better lie? <laughs> or can we go ahead and live in, in our authenticity and stay in a, a combination of follow my heart, but protect it with my warrior, not a damsel. You're far too capable. And to think that these comparisons that you're not smart enough and you're not good enough and you're not worthy of love simply because somebody read a book and gave you a diagnosis, it creates a belief system that just poisons your identity to make it so you're entire goal and your entire dream system has been corrupted with doubt which is horrible if you're taught how to battle and not taught that you can't yeah you're so right and and that's why i love this work that you do with the warrior mindset and i don't really feel that it is in that toxic you know masculinity although i can see why people maybe from the outside before understanding it more deeply may feel that way But really in our society, they're teaching us the exact opposite. They want us to be more in that victim mentality because it's easier to sell to you. It's easier to control you of those things. And I didn't really fully realize that until I start to see the holes in what I was actually doing. Right. So for example, mentally ill as a kid, I was lucky enough to have parents who recognized mental illness as a problem and brought me to receive help. But the people who I was receiving help from in the medical industry, of course, well-meaning, all that they really did was put me on medication and tell me that this was something I was going to have forever and that I'd learn to cope eventually. And when I started to look into things more and I was like, okay, these medications, let's take a look here at the side effects and things like that. One of the medications I was on, you actually can't get pregnant on it. Like it's a contraindication to pregnancy. You shouldn't have kids when you're on it. And I went to my doctor, I think I was about like 18, you know, I wasn't thinking about having kids, but I'm like, this is like in the next decade or so of my life, maybe here. So I should probably ask. And he's like, yeah, you know, most people they're on this their whole life. I started to be like, hmm, so there's no plan to wean me off a drug that is actually making decisions for how I can go about living my life. And while being a mother hasn't been like my all encompassing dream since I was a kid, like it is with some girls. You know, if had that had been my dream, they would have been taking away my dream from me, right? Instead of actually empowering me to figure out how I can solve this on my own and and start to actually gain back that control. And so I don't down on medications as a whole. I like to see them as they get you to a certain frequency so that you can maybe have the strength to go deeper and do that deeper work. But unfortunately, what I see in society as a at large is more just a, that's the solution and it ends there as opposed to that is 
maybe like the flashlight that's going to get you to the bridge. If, if we're using your bridge metaphor in hell. <laughs> so good. Yeah. No, you love it. I'm glad that you did that. This, what I'm going to give is testament to you is that you challenged with your warrior. Is this, is this worth it? Because you're telling me in order to deal with something that you have put a belief system in me, because you have a white coat on or because you have a credential that I am going to have this for. That is a curse, by the way. This is a curse that is put on people because the reality is it is a very, very, very small percentage of people who are born with this, this thing messed up. It's just it can be trained. If you do not have, there are people, and it's like a single digits. This is a very small percentage of people who are born with the inability to control the chemicals in their brain. Like, but this is a this is a fraction of a fraction of people. This is not common today. It is treated as common. It is not. We are calling people things that are incorrect. Well, what is the price tag? Well, it's expensive financially, but what's the price tag on your life? Your dreams, your love, your authenticity, you. This creates a persona and a lifestyle around trying to manage that I am a disorder. I am a mistake. There's something wrong with me. And I am so wrong in my head, I can't even be a mother. If I try to make it right with this solution, your warrior should challenge everyone and everything. Is that true? I need to challenge this to see, is it true or is this one opinion? Because if I listen to you, I will never have a family. Is it worth not challenging? This is a, a different type of medication because mindset is also a medication because it will still poison you. And you had a curse that was put on you, a curse that you are broken, you are wrong, you are messed up, and you need drugs to not be the mistake you are. Challenge that because it makes you live as a broken damsel mm -hmm. who will never have love, who will never have family, and you are not worthy of love because you are broken. There's something wrong with you. You need medication just to make you not as wrong as you are. People diagnose wrong. Mm -hmm. I have taken so many people off of anxiety meds. Not me taking them off. This is where like I have helped them beat the core. So they go, I no longer need it. And I've never felt more clear, more confident and sure in my whole life because I challenged the belief system that there's something wrong with me. And once we got down into those layers and had the courage to dig in and pull that belief system out by the root, they're like, the symptoms were because I had that there. And now that that is gone, I no longer have the symptoms. So I no longer medicate what was wrong with me because there was just something that was poisoning me and I got rid of it. I don't need to take poison, that poison, anymore yeah and so i would also challenge the belief systems these are why they call me the curse breaker is mm -hmm. because i will find this curse this belief system that was put in that there is something wrong with you and we will challenge it to see if it's real we will usually find conflicting beliefs i am not worthy of love i am worthy of love one of these has to go so this is where i say challenge everything this is the warrior part we have to train this is the part of us that is worthy of fighting for. But if you're taught that you're supposed to just stay back, let's go ahead and switch it. You ever, I got one, this is in your field. Ready? You, you ever heard the atta anxious attachment disorders? Yeah. I think there's four of them. I don't remember what they all are. They're all shenanigans to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're talking about like anxious attachment and relationship mainly? Yeah. Yeah. Let's play with it. People love this shit. All right. This is a prime example of somebody just creating some Facebook bullshit that has become identities. I watch mm -hmm. people go, I have an anxious attachment disorder. And so when I get into a relationship, I start having anxiety over our attachment. I'm like, did you used to do that? No, but now I know that, so I do it. Well, I've seen people misdiagnosed and then start taking on the traits of the diagnosis. 
My sister, for example, was diagnosed as bipolar disorder and started doing bipolar disorder shit. And I'm like, you don't see that you are now trying to fit the self-fulfilling prophecy of a diagnosis. This is not true. All of this anxious attachment is, there's like four of them. I don't remember what they are because I remember reading them and I'm like. I think it's like like there's anxious, avoidant attachment is one of them. I think those are the two most, most ones. Um, It's not real. I'm going to go on the record. I'll debate somebody with this. (laughs) I'll go against it. I'll challenge that. I have not not heard it framed as a disorder. That is crazy. Not real. It's not real. I'm going to, I'll go against it. I mean, I've heard people say like, I, I have an anxious attachment style. So they tend to in relationship be more anxious but then, like you said, all these things become self-fulfilling prophecies. Our subconscious is very smart and it wants you correct. So if you're telling yourself, like in my situation, I have anxiety, then it's just going to pull in situations to make you right. So same with these relationship things too, I can imagine. Yeah, oh, there, here they are. Anxious attachment, avoidant, fearful, and secure. Mm. These are the ones I find. There's high avoidance, low avoidance. Yeah, secure uh, is like the ideal one, I think. Right. So silly. Like <laughs> this, this is stuff that just messes people up because it gives them an idea that's wrong with you unless you have just this one perfect way. Well, and but, it's so interesting because these diagnoses, like I'm not sure that these ones are in the DSM five or whatever it's called, for example. Even, but have you read the DSM five? I've gone yes. through this and this shenanigans in there too. It's crazy. And how I like to think about this is I think when it was originally built. It was these doctors and researchers way of saying, okay, if you have this set of symptoms, then we can explain it in this way, but it shifted to, you have this set of symptoms. You are this, you have this, not you're just experiencing this. Um, I had a guest on my podcast who explained it so funny. She said, you know, if you went to the doctor with an itchy throat and they said to you, you have itchy throat syndrome. That's exactly what they're doing when they label you with a mental illness. A yeah, time. you are the manifestation of itchy throatness. And most people mm-hmm. never out of itchy throatosity. And so your <laughs> itchy throatness shall be who you are. So here's medication that you take now forever. And if you don't have an itchy throat, that means the medication is working. Yeah, so crazy. What? No, you are not itchy throat. And I'm going to give you medication you don't need because this this will pass. And I think it's at both ways. I think it works the same way as this physical aspect of things. I think it works mentally that way. When people are told you are itchy throat disorder, this is who you are. And we do not challenge. We become what we are told. Now, this isn't just from doctors. This is parents. This can be friends. This can be somebody who I've actually seen people create complexes from someone they don't even know. Mm. I'll give you one. I'll give you I'll give you a women one. Women, let's just let's give her a a body shame deal. Uh, Let's say like you're out with your girlfriends and you're out hanging out with whoever and dressed. Oh, you girls are all dressed up, dressed to the nines, best dress, favorite outfit, feeling good. Like I feel confident. I feel positive. I feel great. Mm -hmm. And then some drunk asshole, some guy who's barely even coherent bumps into you and says like, you fat hippo pig, watch out with your ugly bacon outfit, fatty. And then walks away and they'll be like, what an asshole, right? And I'm like, yeah, what a jerk. And you'll go like, I know, right? I mean, this doesn't look that bad. I mean, does it really? Wait, do I really look fat in this? Like, because I mean, I don't think I didn't think I did, but I mean, that guy said like four things real quick and like, eh, you know, whatever. He fuck him. <laughs> He's an asshole, right? But then you never wear that dress ever again. Mm. Like, you you don't even know that dude's name. He's not even important in your life. That's not a. That's not even a valuable resource for an opinion yet. Just that stupid, dumb judgment interaction can be enough to say I never wear my favorite dress again because it makes me look fat. It's not this person doesn't matter yet. They ruined one of your favorite things in the world. That's how quickly this stuff can get these these 
the sickness, these belief systems can get plugged in. And yeah. you don't even have to have an important person. Now let's go ahead and put someone who you love the most in there and have your mom say, you're looking really fat. Because a lot of the curses that I have for my women came from a, another woman. Mm -hmm. You need to look like this in order to get love. And you don't look like that. A lot of the women have to break her mom or grandma or an aunt came from a woman. Yeah. Because a lot of the guys, they're not like, I, I love that thing. What are you talking about? You know, as, as silly as it is, guys like the jiggly parts and women are trying to get rid of jiggly parts. <laughs> as silly as it is, guys are like, but I like that. Yeah, but mom said I have to be this size or I'm not beautiful or Cosmo said or this social media said or this who has more followers said or this fitness coach said or these influences that come in to create a comparison and a belief system that deserves to be challenged. But again, goes back to I'm not enough. I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm not worthy. It's but it's so not true. from reality. It's from just, it's just a, a curse that gets put on you that if never challenged becomes you. Yeah, exactly. And we're so easily influenced and often this is not conscious. You know, you don't say like, okay, that person said that to me and now I feel this way about myself. It just happens in the background. Um, but we don't oftentimes even think about it. And so there's no way for us to fully heal from it if you don't even bring that awareness to it. We don't challenge. Mm -mm. The damsel will not challenge. The damsel will just wear a different dress, a baggier one. I will hide myself. I will hide and hope some prince see through all of this protection that I've done to make myself feel better. But then go into the emotional aspect of not being in control again. Look at this is where I'm at. Oh, I'm going to challenge. I'm going to challenge hard on this one. Look at the push that is out there for how people should be dealing with things. I actually have an issue. My daughters love country music. Mm. My country boys are getting their ass kicked right now. My down south boys are getting fucked up, especially by love. There's a couple that are going on. First off, the message for men and women is very different. They're, the guys are like, put her first. Love her more than anything. She's the one. Even if you screw up, be there for her no matter what. White picket fence, give her everything. She's the one. Be good to her. Love that woman. Women are go on your own, slash his tires, kick some ass, be your own you. Go get yours, hot girl summer. <laughs> different, different, whole, totally different thing. Now, what happens when love goes wrong? Because these two have conflicting messages and these guys are getting their hearts ripped out. Well, I would challenge how many songs for country songs don't have drinking. Raise your awareness of how many country songs refer to drinking. Drinking both in meeting somebody and in not having somebody, especially for the guys. Almost every song has a bottle involved. Mm, yeah. I haven't well, thought about what that. Are, what are these boys supposed to do? What's the coping mechanism when you get broken up with or your heart is broken? What are you supposed to do? You drink. That's what you do. Yeah. Well, where's the challenge in that? You become the worst version of you to cope with a hurt version of you. What's how do these guys don't have a chance? No chance at all. There's no support there because you start burning bridges because you're hurting but I'm too drunk to be coherent in who I'm supposed to be through this healing process. Yeah. And I mean, this just highlights how much we are influenced in today's society, like from music to, you know, we all have on our phone so many different influences just at the click of a button. And what I'm seeing become more and more common is, um, especially on social media with talking more about mental health, it's empowering in a way to educate people, but I'm seeing the other side of the coin where now more and more people are starting to to self-diagnose, right? Like, oh, yeah. I heard that people with ADHD, they have trouble focusing sometimes. And I seem to have trouble focusing sometimes. So I think I have ADHD and they start to take on the other symptoms as well. Right? Everybody who has a phone, everyone who has one of these, every person, if you have a phone or a tablet, you have ADHD. Mm. Every single person, because this main job is to give you ADHD. It needs your attention. That's what it does. It's this whole job. Watch uh, the social dilemma. Every social media thing you have is creating an algorithmic understanding of you to give you what you want the most. 
understand, and this is, I'm not going too biblical on this one, but understand, if you read the devil, the devil is not this dude with a red, red spank sign and a pitchfork going, give me your soul, give me your soul. The devil shows up in offering what you want the most. Every time with Eve, you will be like God. You will be the, you'll be like God. You want that. Like, yes, want that. That's what he wants. With Jesus, he's like, do you, listen, I'll make, turn the stone into bread or jump off this mountain and you will be saved by an angel. Or like, I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. What do you want? If you met the devil, the devil would offer you what you desire the most. And he would make it so there are no restrictions. Do you want, you want a drink? Drinks are on me for free. You want attention from other people? How much attention would you like? Because I will give you all the attention that you can handle and more. What do you want? I'll give you, you can have as much as you like. As much as you, all you have to do is just sacrifice your, your time, your authenticity, your, yourself. Like, don't get it into like, look at the, look at the temptation for like, what's the temptation for a woman these days to have an OnlyFans account? You talk to women, like, what's the temptation? Because there are women making six figures from their home. Mm -hmm. And all they have to do is be naked for a price tag. What's the temptation? I don't actually have to go out and do a strip club. I don't have to be in danger. I can do this from home. I can have money. I can have attention. And I can have all the lifestyle I want. My path to freedom is just, and then look at like, this body won't be this way forever. I have a time frame. I better hurry up. Age is not my, my friend here. What's the temptation? And look at the audience. How many guys are in that simp mentality, that 50% or below guys who have love you, who will throw their whole paycheck at a woman for doing it? What's the temptation on both sides? This mm -hmm. is tough. If you think you don't have ADHD or temptation or anything with this, I, this is just one example. There's hundreds of things that are trying to make you not be you or sacrifice authenticity or values or who you're meant to be for you without any thought of the cost later. Because what do you desire the most? We try and follow our heart, but we end up going down this place that we regret. And I'm just going to put it out there. Any any of these kids, put it, you, you, anybody remember how fucking tough middle school was? Go ahead and have your mom be a porn star and then go through middle school. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. You think there's no cost here? You think your kid's not going to have a, oh, shit. Like, your 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 buddy is not going to be able to Google your mom and find her old OnlyFans or info that was leaked. You're not going to find it? I don't care what you put as your disclosure. That stuff is out there forever. And now your kid has to deal with his buddies all having naked pictures of your mom naked videos of your mom doing whatever acts that she does. That's just one field out of hundreds of like, how do we sacrifice ourselves? Mm. You know, and like, this is, it's just, I'm just putting, if you, you're going to say I'm self-medicating, I'm looking at WebMD to say, here are my disorders. You know, there's going to be stuff that says like, well, I had to do that because I had this disorder. I had uh, attention needing connection for love disorder. And so I had to do something to get that that attention met. So I had to do things on online for that. And they'll just create a justification disorder. Yeah. And that's why it's okay that I do what I do. Yeah. And it's hit the nail on the head. It just, it really becomes justification. So instead of fully actually understanding and maybe using that as a tool to go deeper and further understand yourself, we're just like understood and justified. Mm -hmm. It's hard. This is a tough game. This thing is in combat all the time. This is why I say, are you trained or untrained? Are yeah. you trained or untrained? And most people are just going off of the training we got from our parents and our parents were untrained. Yeah. They did the best that they can. No, no question against like, did our parents try? And even more fucked up is some of us have really tough childhoods and our parents did better than their parents. Yeah. My dad was abusive. My mom had a whole bunch of issues. And if you look at their childhood to how they treated us, they did better than their parents did. And I'm like, this is, 
uh, seven out of 10 abuse scales. This is, the, I should be a sociopath based on my upbringing. Mm -hmm. And they did better. Mm. How are we supposed to break a generational curse? How are we supposed to have awareness? How are we supposed to train to understand ourselves? How are we supposed to do this alone? When all of our training suggests I don't have any of those skills and I don't even know what I need. It's tough. We're in a tough game to go ahead and throw on here. Nation of distraction mixed in with denial for who I am, that fight with that duality of ourselves. Mix that in with I need anything to feel good, and that's the path to addiction. This is how you become that. And it both comes in through positive. That's why addiction is so hard. Is denial is trying to protect you from the part that hurts that you don't want to deal with. That's your runaway system. I don't want to deal with that. Mixed in with anything to make me feel good at whatever cost it takes. And you can have as much as you like. And it doesn't matter if it's emotional eating. It doesn't matter if it's self-medicating. It doesn't matter if it's drinking. It doesn't matter if it's porn. It doesn't matter if it's, you, you name it. What Attention, video games, whatever the thing is that makes me feel good as a distraction from me doing my purpose in life. That's, I have to feel good because I don't want to deal with what makes me feel bad. Yeah. No, oh, it, it's so frustrating. And we all get, we get stuck in those loops of feeling bad. And I think that even our feelings of feeling bad become addictions in and of themselves um, that we end up calling back in without even fully realizing it. Because if you are, for example, using, we've used anxiety a lot as an example. So depression, like if you're depressed, well, of course I feel this way. I'm depressed. Like that feel extra depressed. And it just makes you look around and your reticular activating system is like, where can we find reasons to be depressed? Yes, correct. This is also, if you use your warrior to challenge, it is also the cure. Mm. So the quote that we have, the definition in the warrior's way for depression is um, it, catching it before you, you need it. What is it? Perception before, or no, it's uh, prevention before intervention. That's what it is. Prevention before intervention. Understanding, I haven't met a, a person who goes through depression without a shame stack. And what that means is they beat themselves up. They are very mean to themselves. They feel bad for who they are. Guilt and shame are not the same. Guilt is feel bad for what you did. Shame is feel bad for what you are. This is different. And so when you start going, you're a piece of shit, you're worthless, you're stupid, you're not good enough, you're, you start beating yourself up. Now, this is combined quickly with, with, with doubt. Doubt is doubt offers nothing but takes from you everything. If you combine a shame stack with doubt, the way that apathy works, this is when depression gets so far, you're so stacked with all of the weight of the negativity that you hit yourself with. You're fat, you're dumb, you're worthless, you're stupid, you don't deserve love. The way that we beat ourselves down has weight. And when somebody hits apathy, this is when I no longer want to get out of bed. This is when I can't move anymore because I have the weight of so much. I call this Atlas's burden. You're holding the world on your shoulders and you're like, it's hard for me to move with this thing on me. And people will watch you if you're in apathy. Just going to the bathroom takes all of your strength to walk those few steps to get there because you're holding a metaphorical world on your back. This is the part where you need intervention. I, I use a reference of if you were driving and you got you hit mud, for example. Well, if you hit mud, you're like, oh, we're jammed. You can kind of go back and forth and reel yourself out and then pull yourself out and keep going. But if you don't realize you're in mud and just gun it and spin the tires and spin the tires and spin the tires, your truck will sink until your frame is hitting mud. And once you're at that point, you can't go back and forth. You can't get out anymore. We need a tow truck to come out. That's the intervention. That's when you need someone to talk to who helps you pull you out because you just can't do it on your own. And if you do, it's a year's process because now you got to shovel out mud and it may take years to get you out of that. Just little by little, small action, but you still have the weight of the world on your shoulders. You need someone to help you start clearing off the garbage of your shame to be able to find you again. The When it gets to this point, the definition of doubt personification. That means 
the definition of doubt is doubt offers nothing but takes everything. Once you're in apathy, you become doubt, which means you become nothing and it takes from you everything. If you don't know how to fight these two things, you will become nothing. Mm -hmm. You will have no goal, no motivation, no dreams, no movement. You become nothing. It's expensive, but if you can, how do you speak to yourself before it's too heavy? There's a chance for prevention, but at, at, once it gets into apathy, you need intervention. This is where you need help. Someone has to come get you, you know, talk to a professional, talk to somebody who does this because I've gone in and dug people out and then we tow them out and they're like, oh my God, I really put myself deep. And we're like, yes, let's pay attention now to what got you there and then catch it way before you dig it to the frame. It's a lot easier to get there when it's not all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I totally agree. When you're in that state of shame or apathy, you you need someone to pull you out. And something interesting that comes to mind here is the map of consciousness. I'm sure you're familiar with that and the different emotions and their frequencies. So apathy and shame are really close to the bottom there. And I remember when I was reading that book, my of consciousness, he was mentioning that those ones, although you can't escape them on your typically, they're actually not the most dangerous. And as you move your way up and you start to gain more of that energy, then mm -hmm. it can become more dangerous because then you have that energy to now, you know, end your life if that was something that you wanted. And so I think this idea of having somebody to walk you through it is so valuable. And even just coming back to, you know, that fantastic four, we always try to, I think, you know, okay, I'm having a mental issue. Let's fight it with mental, like fight the same thing with the same thing but you need to come at it from all of those different routes. If you want to have a winning battle, no matter what the battle is, right. Even with physical, like how many people in our world are struggling with weight loss or to keep the weight off. And then all they do is be like, okay, I got to, it's the new diet or that new vitamin. That's going to be the thing, anything physical or this new exercise routine. That's really going to be the kicker when, you know, for the most part, the reason people struggle with their eating is actually has more to do with their thoughts around eating and exercise and their emotions that are causing it. So, you know, at least for me, the spiritual piece has been so key because when I was at that lowest of low, when I can remember feeling that state of apathy, I had no faith in anything. You know, I was like your key atheist type of person. Like there's no reason for me to be here. I don't know why someone threw me on this earth. I was, I didn't, I didn't ask for this invitation, <laughs> you know, Agreed. and once you can bring in that more faith aspect and to see more of the reason as to why you're here and a purpose beyond yourself, it becomes so much more powerful. Come on, boys. I'm going to share something with you real quick. Come here, brother. Uh, I got a couple boys in here. Well, this what? this is Apollo, and I don't know how many more recordings we got with this guy because he is old manning it up. You say he looks old. Oh, what a sweetheart! We have had over a decade together. My dude's having a hard time walking lately, and his old bones. This yeah, boy's he's a dad. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's an empath dog though. This other guy, he's not. This guy's an idiot. But this one. Like whenever somebody is hurting, he goes right to whoever's like sad or, or hurt and he'll lay with them, like whoever it is. Like, yes. so I think he's an empath dog. Even if he doesn't know people, he can like sense like people's sadness and he'll just go and like snuggle with whoever it is. Like he's, he's a good boy, but I think oh. he's coming up on his, his last road. Because mm. yesterday, like we had to give him some meds just to get through the day because he couldn't stand very well. Mm. And so yeah. I think, I think he's on his... He, Finishing out his journey. But we got a lot of good years, though. He's a good boy. He's Aww. highly domesticated. All right, Bubba, so I got your spot here, kid. Oh, what a sweetie. Yeah. Now. Dogs are just the best. Oh, I, I mean. This maniac. This is Aries. Aries. Aries is a oh, lunatic. Apollo and Aries. That's so cute. He's a lunatic. This what kind guy. Of He's a mutt. This guy yeah. is four different breeds at least put together, right, kid? Wow. He's a loon. Oh. This, this guy is my he's he's my little shadow though. He is one of those dogs who he's a loon on everybody, but will follow me into the darkest areas of the universe. Like this dog, they make a joke that like he loves nobody but me. He mm. is the funniest dog. He is a he's a trip. He's also 
just naughty by nature. He is mm. he is the one where everyone's like, gosh, this dog is an idiot. I'm like, I can't do that's who he is. I don't know. I truly believe that our dogs like either come with personalities or like, I don't know, maybe adopt personalities that were meant for us, like either meant to teach us something or in some way, shape or form, like really made for us. Well, they're both rescues. Aries was a street dog in Indianapolis. And so he was about uh, just over a year when I got him, but he was like uh, malnourished and just lived off of garbage in the streets. And so he was, uh, he was he was just a nightmare when I got him. Uh, Apollo, he's gone through a few houses just from my family, but he had some pretty tough stuff happen to a broken leg and fell downstairs and hurt, not treated very well. And so, uh, you know, they both came from tough backgrounds. And maybe yeah. it's also a testament to, you know, some other parts of stuff in my life that was kind of interesting how I would, like, I'm, I'm, I'm there for the wounded. You know, I'm there to pull people out who are pull things out. Like there's some sad stories around that because I've had a couple dogs that were killed that were puppies, and I think that gets into like you know a different story of how we're attacked in our life, you know, to try to knock us off our purpose. That's a different thing though. Mm. Some of my my highest losses are like from a couple puppies that were killed, and uh, like it's some like pretty sad stories. Like it's still like it's also become part of my purpose though. Like, um, like I my faith aspect was not always super strong. You know, but mm -hmm. that part when you talked about, you talked about uh, the spirituality aspect of things. And I know that I got into some of that stuff when I found more faith, when I started finding the connection to more of a purpose. And that gets into a, a totally, it's a deep conversation for that. Like when my dogs were killed, they were probably the most pure things I've ever had in my life. And I had a puppy that was killed by, you know, Andrea's dog had a, you know, aggressive food moment, never had one before but killed my puppy, like just killed him. And it was devastating. It was the most pure thing I've ever had in my life. And that little thing loved me. And like, that was little Zeus. He was a, he was like a pocket chihuahua. He was the cutest damn thing I've ever seen. I, when I was building this building, when I was building this room and putting the carpet in, I would wear a hoodie backwards and he would be sleeping in the hood part here. Like while I'm working, he's just in the hoodie. Like he'd be, he'd be in my hood just sleeping oh, oh, hanging out with me wherever I was this little guy was just a part of me building this building yeah. and uh yeah he got he got killed by her dog um having a food aggression moment and then our other boy Leonidas Leo uh we were in the backyard and he saw a bunny or something and took off and got out he, like they don't go in the street and he got hit by a car like chasing something I didn't even see him yeah. go he was a he was about a year and a half and so part of like one of the things where when people try and get into like here's what happens when we die i don't have a damn clue i have no idea and i don't ever claim like i know what happens i know we get a planet or you're gonna wave a palm branch or you'll be you in get a planet you get a planet of, you get a yeah, planet like, i don't know i have no i'm not even claiming to know i've got nothing but if there's a chance in in this existence where i can have a moment with those two little dogs running out to me again. And all I have to do is be the best man I have to be to everyone around me and, you know, to, to everyone. Like, just be the best man you can be. And it gives me a chance to have that moment again. If there's a God or not a God, and that's what I'm going to do, then worth it. Whether it's true or not true, whether it's there or not there, whether it happens or doesn't happen, if there's even a damn chance, well, then... I guess I'll live my life trying to be the best man I can be, oh. you know, and that's one of the things, I don't know what heaven is or whatever, but that's my version of it. Cause I couldn't even explain. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> well, I'm so sorry. That's, that's horrible. Um, but I hope that you get to reconnect with your puppies at some point, you mm -hmm. know, I'm with you. I choose to not have like, I don't think any of us can really know. So why claim to be like, this is what I believe and this is the answer. But I'm just very open to the possibility. And I do think it's likely that we're all reconnected in, in some way, shape or form. One of the guys that I work with, um, we're going to get back into, I think there's a, uh, we, we jump topics here because I don't know if people notice we had to go to the bathroom, but <laughs> like we jump, we're jumping topics and I'll get into that. One of the things when I was, um, working through like some heart stuff i was working with les mcdaniels who was really he's really strong heart side 
Like his mastery is in like understand the heart. And it's not my mastery. This is not that was not my mastery. This is my weakest area as far as which which of my Fantastic Four was strongest. This was my most repressed. This was the one that was shut down the most. So I remember like this idea of like what is faith, what is heaven, what is all things. And I remember the most filled my heart was was a memory where I was out on a boat. Where I was driving the boat. I was right. I'm I'm riding the boat. I'm the alpha. I'm right. I'm the driver. And I got all my girls with me. We got all our teenagers. I got my boys with me. The dogs are there. Um, and we're on this like pontoon boat and we're just going through the lakes and it's sunset. The temperature's perfect. Everyone's laughing. They got music going. Grandma's there. Everyone's having a good time. And bro, I'm driving this boat. The sun is setting. The, the water is flickering orange. And like, it's perfect. Like everything is beautiful. Everyone's happy. Everyone's healthy. Dogs are good. Grandma, good girl. Good. All the kids are good. Everyone's good. And I said, this is the closest to heaven that I think I've ever had. Like it's like, this is the most beautiful moment that I can even think of. Like I, I can't imagine beyond this. And they say, whatever heaven God plans or whatever is better. I'm like, I don't even pretend to have an explanation. I don't even pretend to tell people, here's what happens when you die. Like, I can't even make believe whatever that is. If it's better than that, I got nothing. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no clue. But if it's better than that, I better try and do better for me. Better. That's just, if it's better than that, I can't even make believe better than that. So try and be my best because I don't even know what to expect, let alone tell others. Here's the prize at the end of the rainbow. I don't know. No idea part of faith i guess yeah no it's it's interesting to ponder and and to think about um and even just you know kind of going back to your your dogs there for a minute because i mentioned that you know i think our dogs have a lesson to teach us and something that actually happened with me and my dog recently two little italian greyhounds and back just last summer we were walking along our typical walking path and an off-leash dog of a homeless woman, like a big bulldog, actually came running at us. And my dog doesn't really like dogs, so I picked her up. But next thing I knew, the dog was latched onto my arm, like now attacking me. And, of course, we've talked about my avoidance. Also, flight, of course, is my go-to response. And that's not what you should do when you're attacked by a dog. But I was not expecting to be attacked by a dog in that moment. I tried to run. The dog bit me again on my back, knocked me over. I ended up dropping my dog because I fell down a hill and it bit my dog. I blacked out. Next thing I knew, like, luckily they were all okay. My little dog survived, could have been dead after that incident. But it really came back to even just my own personal lesson of how can I feel safe in the world? Because I felt unsafe for so long, even prior to like actually having this reason to feel unsafe. Right. Yeah, what a crazy scenario. And like it's hard to it's hard to say. Again, like there's two aspects of this. Is there's a difference between fear and danger. There are, mm -hmm. there's a different thing. Being worried that there is a dog around every corner is a different thing than actually being attacked by a dog. Not the same. One is actual danger and one is potential danger. But how do you train to prepare yourself in a world that has danger because there are really scary moments. You know, that's one of could be a mugger. It could be a homeless person. It could be there's danger in this world. There are people who like and will do harm to other people. There's danger. That's a real thing. But to say, like, I'm scared at every turn. Well, that's that's beatable. But to be able to say, how do I manage or how am I supposed to be prepared? Like, that's a different thing. And this is where the trained or untrained warrior part that I believe that there is a part of us. I, this is a mentality that I heard from, it was a monk, a Buddhist monk, who said, if you're over 30 years old and you can't stop somebody who's a, like who would attack you, that's your fault. And the, the question was, like, how is that your fault? How is it your fault if someone were to mug you or attack you at, like, you know, point blank, that it's your fault? He's like, we've well, had 30 years to train. Like, how do you protect yourself? Now, am I saying everybody has to be some sort of Buddhist monk, Shaolin warrior? No. I didn't say that, but you can take jujitsu, you can take a martial art, you can take a self-defense. And in that case, even with a dog attack, there are ways to stop dogs. Even dog training, you you don't pick up your dog, you stop that dog. Yeah. 
exactly. like, cause you pick up your dog, you now became, I became like, the, for sure. Well you, well, you can't protect anymore. Your, your idea to protect made you incapable of protection. It makes mm -hmm. you a shield or a true toy. But if you like push behind and like, mm -hmm. I'm going to fight this dog. Now yeah. you have at least a chance to pin that dog down because they're strong animals. Yeah. But you are you are heavier and you have more intellect. So if you have training, you can then go, whoa, push your dog back and then grab that dog. Yeah. If they had a collar or a leash, you at least have a chance. They're powerful animals, though. Yeah. And so do you also train your body? And I know you train. Mm -hmm. you, you train yourself at least strong enough to hold your body weight. Because then as long as you like they, that dog weighs less than you, you have a chance. Yeah. You know, and so this is the trained or untrained part. There is danger in this world. Do you train for danger? Now, mm -hmm. uh, the other aspect is I've also trained with world-class people, like people who are very, very proficient in combat. Mm -hmm. The more proficient somebody is in combat, the less you'll hear about combat from that person because that area, I feel safe and secure. If somebody wants to do an attack, I don't worry about attack because I'm prepared for attacks. Mm. So I don't stress. I don't have fear and I don't have anxiety around what could happen because in that area, I'm prepared for those scenarios, trained or untrained. But the less proficient somebody is, the more likely they are to become a, you know, statistic. You know, and this is, this is not a shame. This is not a judgment. This is just, well, how do we now there is an opportunity for a random stray dog to come out and attack what do i do to prepare in the future so i do not have fear but i have training mm -hmm. hell you may even just carry some damn dog spray <laughs> something like to be like if this happens i'm about to i'm about to pepper spray a puppy they'll yeah. live they'll live yeah well i mean it's funny because with the anxiety piece right it's all about like over preparing thinking out all of these potential scenarios and what you would do is often what your anxious brain would go about doing but this was never something that i was even even really on my radar and of course now looking at it it sounds ignorant because people do they get attacked by dogs but it wasn't something that i ever thought would happen just walking you know, just in my neighborhood on my daily walk. And so when I thought to pick up that do my dog, I wasn't even thinking, oh, protect. I didn't think, oh, I need to protect. I was just like, my dog doesn't really like other dogs. So I'm going to stop her from barking at this dog. Dog sniffs me. I'll have her in my arms and she'll be more chill. But then, of course, that isn't what happened. And so it's been an opportunity for me to see, like, how can I make myself feel safe in the world? Because I could have taken that moment and then lean into the anxiety piece of it and been like, I'm never leaving the house again. I'm never going for a walk again. And I'm never walking this dog again because she just, like, attracts the dogs to attack her. You know, I could have told those stories. But well, instead, our energy I... does. Our energy does. Yeah. You guys know the, you know the energy thing. Any Caesar Milan or any dog, there's a lot of really, there's some good dog trainers out there. Yeah. I have guys in my group who are professional dog trainers, like they're military trainers and stuff. They're, mm. It's your energy. And if you have, a, oh no, like that dog will, will it'll provoke. But if yeah. you have a strong, like, like strong, assertive, calm and assertive energy, like, hey, calm down. Like that yeah. dog will sense a different presence than food. You're not sure. something to attack. You're something to be aware or pay attention to because yeah. your posture and your strength is very different. But if you don't budge, they question, well, why that? Why didn't they budge? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's, it's just a different thing. It's a, it's, I think there's an energy aspect to it. We're probably in a weeds a little bit here because... <laughs> Because like it's a little scary, and like you know, I could I could say like it's very different. You know, me and you are two we're different creatures. We're different warrior types. We're different things, mm -hmm. and different strengths. Different, different. And so you know, to say do it my way would be incorrect. You know, because you would have to find your your fighting style or your way to how do I handle it. And it may be a, a prevention, because I would I would be able to get more physical. I would, mm -hmm. I, I would one hand that that dog could be a fifty pound dog. I'll one arm it in the air. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter. like, and so that's, a, I could do a different attack than like what maybe you would be able to do, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you are helpless and can't protect because you can still do things that would prevent that type of behavior. Yeah, no, exactly.
So that it's, it's more of a preparation thing. And I think that, you know, luck favors the prepared, but it doesn't mean that you have to be afraid. It's, it's, it's just if you're trained or untrained. Because if you're ready, you don't have to be as scared. Yeah. And I think that that's a really key piece of it because you could start to now, all right, you feel prepared. Like I remember talking with somebody about her travels internationally, a recent guest of mine on my podcast saying, you know, I used to travel with like a door jam and like a rape whistle or something, but then it ended up just serving as a reminder. And I felt that if anything, it was like kind of calling in those types of experiences and making me feel more afraid. And so I think this shows the distinction between, you know, being prepared and then allowing yourself to keep worrying about it. Because if you're prepared, then you can know with certainty what the outcome is. And when you know with certainty, then it eliminates any anxiety or reason to to worry. And so for me, I mean, in this scenario, I plan on top of plan on top of backup plan, right? No more turning away from the dog and picking up my dogs or putting them behind initially yelling, no, go, or like some sort of command to the dog, because if it's anything trained a no is going to stop it in its tracks right if it's a nice little golden retriever or something because my fear was I don't want to spray a nice dog like yeah I can have dog spray but I don't want to just assume that any dog off leash is is gonna attack me so you know say no then I have a treat bomb you can throw treats because whilst you said of course you can pick it up maybe I physically could I think I have the strength but I don't know that I have like the actual guts to do it in that moment so then if the treat bomb doesn't work, sorry, pup, you're getting the spray. If you don't care about treats and you don't care about no, you shouldn't be off leash. <laughs> right? Correct. And that's that's a strategy. You're, <laughs> you're you're ready for your plan. Yeah. And I think that that makes perfect sense. But I also agree with the idea where if you're walking around, like you got your rape whistle and you've got all your stuff. Um, one of the lessons I do is that spiky armor provokes. Mm. If you're wearing an, an energy or an aura looking for problems, if you're looking for trouble, if you're, is there trouble there? Is there trouble there? Is that danger? Uh, if you're Jason Bourne, when you walk into a diner and you're looking at the exits and memorizing license plates, it's like, and the guy at the counter, he can probably handle himself and there's probably a gun in the glove, glove compartment of the truck. If you're in this like uh, mindset, that energy attracts negativity. It, it provokes the attention. If I'm sitting there waiting for a rape whistle, everyone's a rapist. Like, hold, hold on a second. You know, and it's the same thing where you'll talk to guys who are well-trained, um, especially military guys, they're conceal and carry. They're like, you will not know I have a gun on me. Yeah. It's like, you don't show your gun. You don't provoke. You don't out there like you're trying to to show that you're the baddest because my gun is hanging out. He's like real, truly trained, real, like trained soldiers. They're like, you'll never know that I have this because it's not a provoke. It's a prevention. This is not meant to antagonize or look for problems. It's to hopefully never have to use it ever. It's to hope this is never a requirement. And even still, it is the last phase that I go to out of all prevention. This is after the treat bomb doesn't work. This is after the, hey, no, calm down. It's after that doesn't work. It's, hey, I can see you're, I'm trying to diffuse. If that doesn't work and it goes to extreme violence, then I have to. But it's the last resort. But if you're wearing your rape whistle out in your mouth looking for rapists and you've got your gun out and you're, who's going to be the problem today? Like, that spiky armor provokes and people don't have spiky armored people. It provokes. And you notice there are people who just seem to be gravity for conflict. Yeah. People who like, they go out to the concert and how come, you know, John always gets in a fight or, you know, Steve is always in a fight. It's like, mm -hmm. well, his spiky armor provokes people. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And so there's, there's that aspect of that energy that you're, putting out it's almost like like you, i think you mentioned it before the law of attraction putting out i'm looking for bad i'm looking for bad i'm looking for bad you will find it you you're hunting for it yeah and then we'll also create a self-fulfilling prophecy if you'll start going to places where like i hope a dog wants to fuck around today mm -hmm. i'll go where the homeless people are and see if someone's stupid dog is off leash today you're like mm, now we're looking for problems Yeah. This is a this is a, a part where people think they're being tough or being strong. Really, it's exposing your fear and you're trying to overcompensate for something that you aren't secure in. 
Mm. You don't feel confident. You don't feel prepared. And you want to try and test your metal by putting yourself in dangerous or tough situations. It's more of an exposure of something that you need more training in, not a flex of how tough you are, because truly strong people don't have to tell you how strong they are. Just like truly good people don't have to convince you they're a good person. Mm. If you ever hear somebody try and say, I'm a good person, but I'm a good person, I'm a good person, who are you trying to convince? Me or you? Mm -hmm. These kind of things where you just watch overcompensation, spiky armor just provokes. Yeah. And I mean, even outside from, you know, like actual danger in the world, bringing it back to like mental health and things like that as well. I think this carries the same truth in that. You can feel prepared for what to do if you're going to, you know, feel a strong emotion for maybe you're somebody who can relate to that anxiety, like maybe feel that panic attack feeling coming on. Feeling prepared is a whole other thing than, all right, well, I'm going to be re ready. You're like, what, when is it going to come on, right? Like, <laughs> once that sweat comes, <laughs> I'm ready to respond. And then it just calls it in even faster. Yeah, it's it's powerful stuff. And this is uh, the battlefield of the mindset. I, I like that. We're, let's go back to the mental health aspect. Boy, we can go in the weeds, can't we? But also, it, it's frustrating. I'm glad you're okay because a dog, that's a big dog attacking. So I'm glad you're all right. Like, yeah. Those are scary moments. It's a, it's a scary thing. So I'm glad you're okay. And I hope that hasn't stopped you from like, you know, not taking your dogs out. Has it, has it slowed you down for that? Has it like it definitely did slow me down at the beginning and it was tough because my dog was already a little bit of a reactive dog, like more anxious outside. And we had been working on that. So then now to have this, it just kind of back really far. But now we're at the point where even just, you know, earlier today, we walked actually past a dog right on the same side of the sidewalk for us. And there was no barking. I didn't have a, you know, dissociation right. leaving my body. And so, you know, <laughs> definitely progress being made. Have you taken your dogs to dog parks and stuff to like just socialize? So they said, um, like I took them to a dog trainer and the dog trainer actually recommended not to bring them to dog parks because mm -hmm. it's just going to, if anything, increase their anxiety and instead just have a select dogs that we go and visit. So that's kind of what we have little like puppy play dates with dogs that we know we can trust. And is it, is it the dog's they... anxiety or yours that they're worried about? Um, I think it's <laughs> more the dogs, but I think mine is definitely an aspect. They go off our energy. <laughs> Exactly. Off of our energy. And so like, if you're like, oh, this is bad, this is bad, it's bad. The dog will be like, mom says something's bad. What is it? Yeah. Exactly. Like they go off our energy. They go off of us a lot more. This is, I just have dog trainers who just, they'll talk around it. So. Yeah. No. And I think that's why, you know, how I went to say, you know, dogs have a lesson to teach us. Like they're going to teach you something. If you got some sort of emotional, mental imbalance, mm -hmm. like your dog's going to reflect that back to you a thousand percent. Agreed. <clears throat> I love, I'm, I love dogs. Mm -hmm. Love dogs. Anyways, yeah, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. I got, I got a thing for you. I'm going to go back to where we got off into the weeds. We, like, I really, we came back. We we're in a totally different topic. We got into love and all that kind of stuff. But um, I thought it was interesting. We were talking about how <clears throat> something that I wrote down that you were saying, we've never had more information in the world, but we've never had more disorders. Like, we have never had more information on health and fitness and wellness, and yet we have an obesity epidemic. We have never had more understanding of how people operate in the world. We've never had more Freuds and Carl Jungs, and we've never had more, you know, you name it, your Jordan Peterson, your Alan Watts. We've never had more great minds that have been able to list how do people operate, and yet we have more people with mental issues. Like, how are we more, we are more informed and have more problems? Mm. You know, we've never had more anxiety, yet anxiety has become a regular thing, a socially acceptable thing. But I don't remember reading anything in like, even in like the Great Depressions and stuff, there are people now who have more anxiety than people who were Holocaust survivors and slaves. Yeah, it, There was less suicide and anxiety in those than people who have identity disorders yeah it's crazy so how do we have more information and more access to help and more access to knowledge and more access of understanding and more problems mm. there's something wrong with this system there's something wrong here where people are not being taught correctly or not being trained right 
And that, you know, it goes into all these different beliefs for like what is right and what is wrong, what's success, what is failure, what is, you know, what am I supposed to do for the answers versus how am I supposed to do something to, you know, know myself. I think the mastery of even just knowing yourself, it's amazing how many people, I work with people who are very, very intelligent, who like when we start going through value training, can't narrow, narrow down their top two values accurately. It's hard. It's hard because we want it to be some answer, but it's not our true answer. How do I operate? How do I treat myself or how do I handle situations? What's my main system that I use when things are going wrong or right? What is my fulfillment? People want it to be faith or family, but when you get down to it, it may end up becoming growth and service. You know, we don't, it's hard for us to figure out what that is. I want it to be joy, but it's not joy because I don't handle my problems with joy. I handle my problems with collaboration. You know, so you may realize your your core values are different. It's really interesting how much we don't know ourselves. It is really interesting. And that piece that you mentioned about, you know, there's more information available and then yet we know ourselves. And part of me wonders is, is if it is because we tend to seek so outside of ourselves, right? If anything's going wrong with you, you Google it, right? Instead of like actually feeling into it where you know, not too long ago when, for example, the internet, or you can just punch something into Jap GPT and get an answer right away, then you had to sort of figure these things out on your own. And I think there was just naturally a lot more introspection and actually going inwards, but we're so focused on everything external, doing, doing, learning, learning, instead of actually being. That's well said. Yeah. Doing, doing, learning, learning, but I'm not being. I'm a human doing, not a human being. Mm, I love that. I'm a human doing, not a human being. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where that's your, that's well said. I, that's it's pretty tough. It's like, cause people are trying to measure up. This gets into you, you mentioned before the comparison curse inside of you and you have to like, I got to dig in. I got to find out who was I comparing myself to for being too stupid. Like yeah. who is it compared to who, mm -hmm. you know, it's not compared to a little kid cause you're brilliant. But compared to what, like the top scientist in the world, like who are we comparing ourselves to? You know, yeah. I don't know. Who is it? You know, there's some comparison there, but this comparison curse, like uh, another thing that is tough for girls. You, you tell me because you, you've had a lot more conversation with women. Uh, denial is at the core for most curses that women have. But like the curses are put in at a very young age and denial is combined. Look at makeup for example, like mm -hmm. if you don't like your face and you don't like how you look, you will do things to change it. Mm -hmm. Well, this means I have to look like something else in order to be good enough. But I have women say, if I went to the store without my makeup, I would feel really insecure. I would feel judged or feel like that. I don't like, I can't go out without my makeup on. Like I, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, What's wrong with your face? Um, Andrea works in the beauty industry. I won't say what, what what company, but the beauty industry. If somebody works in this industry and shows up to a makeup place, a place they sell, you know, some sort of cosmetic line without wearing makeup, they will say you need to make up because you do not represent beauty. Your real face does not represent beauty. What kind of curse does this put in there? Well, this puts in combinations. There's at least four. First, there's doubt. I'm not good enough. Just mm -hmm. who I am is not good enough. There's doubt there. But there's also bargaining in there. But you could be good enough if you look like this. If you wear this or you use this product or you have this exercise machine or if you have this cologne or whatever, you could be good enough if... But then there's also fear. If they really knew what I really look like, would they still accept me? But then there's denial with, if I'm using these products, I'm accentuating. I'm, ex I'm, I'm just enhancing myself mm. instead of masking who I really am. This is four curses put together on one attack. It's a team sport. Somehow you're supposed to understand authenticity when that was put in when you were 12 years old. Yeah. Cosmo says this is what you're supposed to look like. And now let's go ahead and be realistic. Before my generation, before like within 40 years, before my generation, even in my lifetime, 
your comparison was local. You were compared to the people at your school or the people in your community, or the people your, your your reach for how far your comparison circle went was maybe a few hundred people to maybe thousands at the most, at the most. And that's if you have a big community or live in a big city, right? Mm -hmm. Let's multiply that by billions now and make it global because that's what social media does. So now you're not comparing yourself to, I don't know, the cliche head cheerleader. Now you're comparing yourself to the top 0.001% in Russia, India, Africa, Europe. Like, good luck. Yeah. Half of it's Photoshopped. Most of it's Photoshopped. So you're never good enough. How are you supposed to beat that as a 12-year-old girl still growing? You're still developing. You you got to compare yourself against a 27 year old woman. Good luck. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be good enough. These are tough curves. This is stuff where like, is more information really helping? Because mm -hmm. now you have an international curse you have to beat. It's not even local. It's not like I'm just not as pretty as you know so and so. You know, in the beauty club or I don't know whatever the stuff is. I don't know, but it's no different than like I'm not good enough. As like the captain of the football team, I don't have the burden of uh, performance. Mm. You know, I'm not as good as that guy, or I'm not as strong as him, or I'm not as smart as that guy. You know, he's the valedictorian, and I'm C student. I must not be very good. You know, yeah. there's the, the both side burden of beauty. Now, even, even you tell me this, please. Mm. Women have burden of beauty. That's still there because men do. We are visual. We're visual creatures. We we do see beauty and we go, oh, in a woman's beauty, no, no argument. Trump's a dude's beauty. A hundred percent. Like, no question. A woman's beauty is different than a guy's beauty. It's not like a, a woman can stop traffic with being beautiful. A guy won't. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good looking the dude is. He's not stopping traffic. So like there, there's no argument. Like there's there is a thing there. You can appreciate the beauty of a woman. There's a thing. You know, so there's that burden of beauty, but then guys have burden of performance. We have to be good to be chosen. We have to be good at something, what our status or our potential or, you know, what is it that we're working on, our dream, our vision. I'm going to be a, I'm gonna be a musician. I'm going to be a painter. I'm going to be whatever. There's a potential that you go, I'm attracted to because there's safety, security. There's an aspect there that makes it so we can grow and we'll have a happy, healthy life. There's a thing that you're chosen for what you do. There's an aspect. That's why most time girls date older guys. They're further along in having progress in provision. They just, okay, that's how nature works. Got it. Makes sense. Hypergamy. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now it's work because not only do women have to have, I got three teenage girls here that are struggling because they like to be athletes. They play volleyball, basketball. They play sports, soccer. We got, we got all three. They'll play their different sports but also have to maintain burden of beauty. So they have those fake nails on while they're trying to play volleyball and come back with finger injuries because those nails hurt. You can't have beauty and performance same category for this because it does damage. Like it's more of a liability. So it's hard. How do I perform and do what I love to do? But then also look like I'm supposed to look in this comparison sphere. All right. That's a long explanation. I know. But you're in the world. Like, tell me, how do I perform, but also um, maintain this comparison? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy that this is even a battle that we're facing in today's world. I think it's clearly a losing battle in this, right? Um for me, what comes to mind is, you know, it's sort of, I guess, balancing those different aspects of yourself as well and knowing that you can be multifaceted. So like from a woman's standpoint, right, like maybe being an athletic woman, which I can relate to because I played competitive hockey growing up and I still do, you know, like working. Type stuff. I'm not a bodybuilder by any means, but I, you know, I lift weights and stuff like that um, is trying to find that you know, you can have these different aspects of yourself and because you are able to, you know, get down and dirty and like lift the heavy weights, it doesn't make you less sexy or feminine or conversely, if you sometimes like doing your hair, it doesn't make you a less 
effective athlete, but to do both at the same time is definitely a challenge. And I would say even outside of sports, we also see this in the work world for women because it's this focus on, you know, okay, I not only have to do good and match up to my male peers, but I also need to look the part and be a professional looking woman and, and garner the attention of my mate or whatever that may be. And so I, I don't know, like, I don't think I have like a really good answer for this, except for the fact that a conundrum that a lot of us are in. And then we wonder why we feel like we're on a hamster wheel or, or never good enough, right? It makes perfect sense. It doesn't seem like it's working, but it also goes against, you know, most of our core desires in many ways too. Like there's a lot right now, if you just watch the psychology world, like there is a, a true, like we we are watching to figure out, can men and women work together in the same space without problems? So far, it looks like no. <laughs> like there's been countries that have tried to have all the workers dressed as like as much you know, androgynous as they can, like wear a box outfit that looks as unappealing in every way for both sex. Like it, we need you to not be attracted to each other and work. Hmm. Like they, there's country, I think it was in Indonesia or something Like you have to wear like this, like really unattractive outfit and now go to work because like, there's, when you put men and women in a space, eventually there becomes an issue, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't spend eight hours you know directly next to somebody like and just and never have conversation or, or attraction to who they are as a person it's difficult now i'm not saying never it's not absolutes but it just it's going to be tough when you start getting used to a person that's like if they are attractive or you enjoy their personality and you spend six hours more a day with that person than your person it, it gets tough because you get used to their smells or their mannerisms and their their jokes and the conversation. And so far, it's become an issue where we don't know, can men and women really work together without liability? Like, it becomes hard. But then also, all it takes is one false accusation. And I know guys that will not talk with their female supervisors without somebody else present. They're like, mm -hmm. all it takes is one false accusation and I'm sexual harassment charge i'm like I will, i'll have i have to have somebody around to make sure like they're like he never said that I'm like won't do it i've seen people who have been fired for things that are very untrue and it, it's on their record now that you are sexual harassment charge that's why you were fired and they're like i never said it though that wasn't me that well you were accused of instantly guilty so that's a liability there's a lot of things that are like yeah we don't know if it's working yet now taking it in account, there was the conversation of if the complete box androgynous outfit, well, that's taking away your freedom. That takes away your individuality. That takes away. So maybe that's too far. But then where is the line between like how attractive a man or woman dresses versus like, you know, that complete androgyny, like no attraction at all outfit? Well, where's where's the line for appropriate to inappropriate? Where is it? You know, and so you'd have the argument of like, look at the way that we dress to accentuate parts what's the reason for high heels well it changes your body shape it changes the way your body is shaped mm -hmm. you know it's okay that's going to do a different thing um you, you have push-up bras waist trainers fa fake fingernails um fake eyelashes extensions for hair different color lips different makeup and blush which is meant to show like you know sexuality which is I know not the intent, but that's what it does. It shows the the rosiness of the cheeks and the the heat in in somebody's you know face when it's you know there's intimacy. And so you have all of these these parts that are changed, you know, accentuated or you know looks attractive. And then you have smells and perfumes and whatever is worn. Where's the line? You know, where is the line? So you know, I heard a conversation that was said like, well, what if a woman wore like lingerie to work? Is that appropriate? And they're like, oh, no, that's not appropriate. You're like, oh, okay, cool. Um, what about if they said, like, lipstick? Is that too far? They're like, well, no, lipstick is fine. Like, okay, somewhere between lingerie and lipstick. Well, we don't know where the line is. I don't know where's the line at. It's just somewhere between here. But I don't know, because these are all also things that are supposed to promote attraction. 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and it can go the other way for guys, you know, like some form fitting outfit or a certain smell or a p- posture or a conversation, like the things that guys do to get attention. Like, where's the line? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We don't know. And so now we're trying to figure out, you got burden of beauty, burden of performance, and then how do we work together? And is it working or not working in conflict between I have to look a certain way, perform a certain way, and then what's the liability of being able to do both? Here we are. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. Good luck. We're trying to sort out what is the right thing, which, of course, let's go back to mental health, creates a whole new set of issues creates a whole new set of where am I right? Am I wrong? Am I the problem? If I even talk to her, am I going to be sexual harassment charged? I don't talk to anybody. I'm just going to keep my fucking head down. So nobody accuses me. Like, let's go ahead and throw that on top of you also have an impossible workload. Yeah. Well, no wonder people have so many disorders. And that's just go to work. That's not even, that's not even an actual issue yet. Yeah. I know. And then you start to bring in the other aspects, because when you're talking there about, you know, like burden of beauty and burden of performance, I would argue that women are taking on both burdens days, right? Like increasingly more and more. And during the workplace, we have that burden of performance. Then there's the burden of beauty showing up and, and being womanly and being attractive. I mean, I don't usually think about it in terms of this workplace scenario, but it is interesting. But like even just in your home life, right? How can you balance being like a boss woman in your day? And then also being this like sensual, sensitive woman in your relationship. And then add on to that, the, I don't want to call it like burden of nurturing, but we're calling it all burdens, so right? Now you also have to balance the family life and more and more so with women actually being at work and, and handling all these burdens, their kids are being raised by people who aren't even in their family. And so it just creates this whole chaos where it's like, well, no wonder nobody's normal. Our society is not normal. <laughs> it also takes away from, again, the authenticity of what we are, who we are. And it's tearing families apart. Yeah. It's tearing families apart. It's making people guys are feeling less and less worth because I'm, it used to be protect, provide, preside. It used to be I, I take care of all the heavy lifting, and now they're saying you're not needed. I can do everything without you. You're like, well, where do I fit in? I'm not needed anymore. You don't need me. You're like, well, that's really tough on guys. Guys are struggling. Guys are also taught they're supposed to do everything alone. You're not supposed to have help. You're not supposed to reach out. You're weak. You're pathetic. You're vulnerable as weakness. Um, you know, you're acting like a bitch or whatever the terminologies are. It's tough for guys. What are they supposed to do? It's tough for women because now you're expected to wear all of these hats, hats that are inauthentic. They're, it's it's actually pretty incredible. I see women who are considered extremely high performers, self-made millionaires. They did. They built the company from the ground up. They compete with the the wolves and and they win. And they're like, the energy and effort to keep that up when I just want to be a good mom, I can't do both. Like it wears me out. But then also with hypergamy, if you're a top 1% like person, how do you date equal or up? Who wants to choose somebody who like they compete all day home and then all day and then they come home and compete too. Like where's the love nurture there? It's like, there isn't any. And it's tough too, because, and this is a tough one, ladies, guys are not attracted to check. At least not an alpha, not a guy who like is a provider. He's not going to look at your paycheck and go, how much of that money can I get? He doesn't want your money. I don't care about that. Mm-hmm. Not, not concerned with what your status is. I'm not going to go, what's your status? That makes me attracted to you. We don't want your status. We want love, nurture, connection, like encouragement. Be kind. Like, guys don't choose women because they have a, a degree. They cho- choose women because the connection that you have, growth and kindness and love and encouragement. Mm-hmm. You know, I, when I did that with the guys, I did the survey, and I was like, what's a, what's a woman's role in a relationship? And it was crickets for a minute. They're like, crap, I really don't know what her job is. They knew theirs. There's nine things. We did a whole podcast on that. Nine things. We know our job, protect, provide, do the heavy lifting, do the gross stuff, like all of our stuff. And every single thing on a man's list was a service in some way to provide or help other people. But what's her job then? And they're like, man, I don't know. I'm like, well, what would you like it to be? And like the general consensus was like, 
at least start with just be nice. <laughs> at least be nice. I don't need her PhD. I don't need her paycheck. I don't need her to do all these things. And women will argue, yes, you do need me. Like, well, not for those. But we do enhance each other's lives in a different way. You know, where the guys will do the jobs that women can't do, you know, and that's a tough, it's a strong word, but like, oh, well, we got to move that 400 pound thing up three flights of stairs. You want to grab the bottom or the top? You're like, I'm going to have Josh do it. <laughs> like, we're going to have the boys take that thing. You go ahead. But who wants to unpack the dishes? Well, you know, he's breaking them if he does. So then I got the dishes. I'll unpack those and put those the way it's supposed to be so they don't get busted. We, there's a good teamwork aspect of it, but it's not going to be able to bring your status to the table when we're going to team up on things. I don't yeah. need, it's not my, I'm not in love with your status. I'm in love with who we are as a, as a team. Yeah. And I think that goes to show why so many relationships are having problems these days, because it's no longer really in the same way at two partners coming together who have the two different tasks, it becomes more competition, right? Because with, you know, the, the men taking more care in the house and doing things and women stepping into making more money and contributing that way to the household, when everybody's doing the same job, not only is that polarity gone, which creates that attraction between those opposites, but also that competition comes. And so I just think it's inevitable that problems are coming up in, in today's relationships. Yeah, it's not wrong. I, 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 um, when it gets to the hypergamy stuff in this conversation, I think here's what we should do, Nicole. I'm just going to propose. Mm -hmm. Let's put a pin in this thing yeah. and we'll record another one. Because I think okay. right now we're at, we're at. We're like almost at three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> We've been we, recording for like three hours. <laughs> at least. Right? Or almost. like. <laughs> at, at least. I think longer. And so let's put a pen. Let's record more. Because if anybody's made it to this point in this conversation, just going to put some praise out there. If you've listened to Cole and myself, and mostly myself, because I've got this thing telling me that Rick talks way too much. So like <laughs> I have like 75% of the conversation. So that's, I got to chill it out a little, but if you made it this far, you're a legend, you're a superhero. If you made it this far in the conversation, we want to praise you to say like you are a badass, and thank you for spending the, the quality time that you have with us. Okay. And hopefully there's some value. I feel like you bring value. Mm -hmm. I hopefully, yeah. hopefully feel like I bring that's value. Great. And people are able to go, you've given us new things to think about. Mm -hmm. And some of you are like, I had to listen to each part separately because I was taking completely different notes with these topic changes. <laughs> yes. So I appreciate you very much. I thank you for you. thank you for hanging out. Thank you for us doing another another episode. And let's put it up on both. Uh anxious and ambitious. Um do you wanna do you have anything that you're promoting right now that you want people to jump in and work with you on? Like like this is a, do you have anything that you want to share for people to jump in and work with you? Um, no, I was just going to share, you know, if you've enjoyed this conversation, then I'd recommend going and listening to the conversation you and I had on my podcast, because it was really insightful as well. We talked about some similar things, but definitely went on to some different tangents over there. So if you've enjoyed this conversation, I think you would enjoy that one too. Absolutely. Um, if you go to the Warrior's Way Mindset, if you check us out, um, the links will be in the bio on this. Um, just go in and check it out and grab in. We have everything from do-it-yourself tools, which is where I give you the weapons and the tactical training to be able to go through the conversations that we've had. Uh, this gets into fear, doubt, depression, anxiety. This teaches how does it work and gives you at least the tools. But this is a do-it-yourself option. Or if you want to join my, my warriors and you want to work with us, uh, book a phone call. Let's have a conversation and see if working and learning how to have a guide that teaches you the solutions and shows you the way out of hell. That's what we do. And so we train your mind and your body side to make it so that you can actually make those choices to pull yourself out and then help you teach others to do the same. It's a ripple effect. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, Nicole, it's been an honor, and I hope that you Likewise. crush it. <laughs> I'll, talk, <laughs> I'll talk to you. Sounds good. Talk to you later. Just let me know when you plan this to come up to go out, and I'll help promote it.